Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Maurizio Cecconi. I am from Humanitas University and Humanitas Research Hospital in Milan. I have the pleasure to chair this uh, session on vasopressors with Professor Tony Gordon from Imperial College in London. I'm also happy to see Tony here because he was blocked waiting for a PCR test up to some minutes ago. So we will be with you all morning and uh, we are going to start uh, with the first speaker. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Jean-Louis Teboul. We talk about hemodynamics, I don't think I need to say anything about Jean-Louis Teboul. <laughs> Everyone knows him and uh, he's also a friend and he's also the treasurer of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. Jean-Louis. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. I'm happy to, to present uh, this uh, lecture about the benefits of vasopressors. My conflicts of interest are on this slide. For me, there are at least two benefits of vasopressor therapy, and I will speak, I will focus on norepinephrine because this is the most used and the first line of vasopressive agent. First, of course, this is the reason why we start norepinephrine is to correct severe hypertension rapidly. And this effect is through its vasoconstrictive effect uh, due to the activation of the alpha-1 adrenal receptors. As you know, this is a, a a figure of a vascular small cell, muscle cell, and you know at the surface of the cells are some receptors and some adrenal receptors, and norepinephrine will bind to this receptor to to contract the vessel and to to have its constrictive effect. It is indicated when vascular tone is assumed to be depressed. Of course, this is the reason why to give a vasopressor. And septic shock is a good example because septic shock is characterized by a depressed vascular tone due to the presence of many mediators, inducible endosynthase activation, etc. And this, as you know, leads to vasodilatation and hypotension. But the problem of hypotension is that it can lead to worsening of organ hypoperfusion. And this is a problem. Let's remember the autoregulation of the organ blood flow, organ blood flow on the y-axis. You can take the kidney, the brain, whatever. And mean arterial pressure as the upstream pressure for organ perfusion. You know, this uh, relationship with a physiological plateau where you can change your AMAP, nothing happens in terms of organ blood flow which doesn't change, and it is fortunate. But sometimes, in case of shock, below a certain level of mean atoll pressure, if mean atoll pressure decreases further, you also have a decrease in the blood flow of the organ, kidney, brain, etc. And this is the issue we have to deal with. When we have intensivists, we have to be close closer to the plateau of the relationship. This is important, this is our job. So organ hypoperfusion and tissue hypoxia may be related to profound hypotension, and this may occur in spite sometimes of high cardiac output. This is a study I like to show for years because it is well illustrative of the importance of CV hypotension. It is a study performed in septic shock patients uh, years ago, and the authors showed that the area under MAP65 was the best predictor of certainty mortality in this study, uh, suggesting that not only the severity of hypotension, the deepness of hypotension, but also the duration, the time, of hypotension is important to consider. So we have to rapidly correct hypotension when it occurs. And also what we know is by correcting severe hypotension, organ perfusion and tissue hypoxia may improve. And there are some data in the literature suggesting that. For example, 
this study by uh, the team of Marseille in France uh, shows that in very severely hypotensive patients with a baseline value of 54 meters of mercury, if you give norepinephrine, you can uh, increase MAP to 73 and 72. This can improve urine output. This can improve creatinine clearance. This can decrease blood lactate. And this while Kadak index, which was very high in this study, above five, before norepinephrine was given, did not change. So it is not an effect which, which was, was due to Kadak index, but probably to arterial pressure. Probably when you gave norepinephrine in this study for the kidney and autoregulation uh, of the renal blood flow, the improvement in MAP in terms of uh, uh, increase 54 to 72 led to an improvement in the perfusion of the kidney and the kidney function finally. Another benefit of norepinephrine is to increase cardiac output when started early, when started early. One of the mechanisms is to increase cardiac preload. Norepinephrine is able to increase cardiac preload. This is a study we performed years ago with Olfa Imzawi in my unit, and we included 105 patients with septic shock. As you can observe, we gave norepinephrine early, and norepinephrine early increased MAP from 54 to 76. Stroke volume index also increased with norepinephrine. And we measured global and diastolic volume index, which is a marker of um, the global cardiac preload. And this was obtained by transpenary thermodilution. And this increased with norepinephrine. And also, pulse pressure variation was measured and decreased with norepinephrine in this study. So finally, we concluded that with norepinephrine administered early, we could have an increase in preload, calac output, and decrease in preload dependency. We found more or less same results in another study, another group of patients with Xavier Monet in our unit. And again, we gave norepinephrine very early. The MAP at baseline was uh, 49 and increased to uh, 71. Cardiac output and all the markers of preload increased in this study and also indices of preload responsiveness decreased in this study. So the message of the two studies we perform more or less at the same time was that norepinephrine increased cardiac preload, increased cardiac output in preload-dependent patients and reduced the degree of preload dependency. This is exactly as fluid infusion does, exactly the same effects. What could be the mechanism Probably, it is an hypothesis, of course, by blood redistribution from unstressed to stressed volume. And this is what we tried to confirm in another study, a complicated study. I just want to give you the results because we try to estimate the mean systemic pressure or mean systemic feeling pressure. It is complicated because it is just for research. It's difficult to do. Uh, for the clinical practice. Nevertheless, we estimated this pressure, and with Romain Persichini, Xavier Monet, and others, uh, we uh, did this with a high dose of norepinephrine and a low dose of norepinephrine. And as you can observe, uh, Kalak index increased with the highest dose, not surprising for us, surprising for others, but not for us. And also, the mean systemic pressure was higher with the highest dose of norepinephrine, meaning that the effective blood volume increased with norepinephrine. And we said that in spite of the increase in venous resistance, we also estimated venous resistance. This increased 
Nevertheless, the venous return increased with norepinephrine through this increase in mid systemic pressure, related, probably related to blood redistribution from unstressed to stressed volume. There is another effect of norepinephrine uh, when you administer early. It is to increase cardiac contractility. Don't forget that norepinephrine is a beta-1, uh, beta-1 adrenergic agent. And in this other study with alpha mz again and others, we measure the effects of norepinephrine administered early in patients with septic shock and with echocardiography, and we observe an increase in LVEF, left ventricular ejection fraction, but also of velocity timing role, which is a marker of stroke volume, confirming that norepinephrine can, can uh, increase cardiac index in these patients. And this, in spite, by definition, I would say, in spite of the increase in blood pressure, and therefore, in spite of the increase in LV afterload, all the indices of cardiac function improved. This suggests an effect, a positive effect on contractility. And this was observed also in patients with reduced left ventricularization fraction at baseline. Those patients, you know, who have a LV ejection fraction less than 45%, a magic number for some authors in some studies. Even these patients improved cardiac index and LVF uh, early with norepinephrine. And this could be due to an effect on the beta-1 receptors, which are not yet regulated at the early phase of sepsis, or an effect through an increase in the coronary perfusion pressure, you know, which is, which is related to the increase in the diastole pressure, which, which is the organ per, the perfusion pressure for the left coronary vessels. Okay, so now if we combine fluid and norepinephrine, what could be the effects? Again, we could have beneficial effects. The potential advantages of this combination is first to increase the mean systemic pressure more than fluid alone, resulting in a better cardiac output. And this is something we, we investigated very recently. This paper was published last week in Critical Care. And Imanada is the first author. It's a study we did in our unit, and we performed two passive aggressive test maneuver uh, to replace fluid in administration. And before, uh, for a high dose and a low dose of norepinephrine. And what we observe, we observe that the change, the delta, the mean systemic pressure was higher uh, with the highest dose of norepinephrine when we gave volume, because when you perform PLR, you get volume finally to the central blood volume compartment compared to the lowest dose of norepinephrine. So we have uh, some potential, potential on the session, a synergic effect of norepinephrine and volume infusion. Second advantage is to correct, to correct hypotension better than fluid alone. Don't forget that. Don't forget that fluid alone is a vasodilator. This is a study by uh, uh, the team of Maurizio Cecconi. And uh, in this study, in this study, the authors uh, distinguish between preload responders and non-responders. As you can observe, fluid infusion decreased systemic vascular resistance in the case of fluid responders when cardiac output decreased. So fluid alone is not a vasopressive agent. It also limits fluid overload. By definition, I would say, if you give norepinephrine, you know that fluid overload is bad for the patient. Positive community fluid balance, you know, is an independent uh, factor associated with mortality. This is a, a result from the SOAP study conducted by Jean-Louis Vincent, but it was confirmed by many others. And interestingly, when you start norepinephrine very early, within the first hour after the starting fluid infusion, you can 
avoid fluid overload and you can limit the volume of fluid infusion. This is a study performed by uh, Gustavo Ospina Tascon and we were many authors in this study and the last author is uh, Jan Bakker and Daniel de Bakker uh, are, or also is one of of this study and in this study you can see that in the group of patients who received a very early norepinephrine, there was less administration of fl resuscitation fluid compared to the delayed uh, administration. And also, it, m it may improve tissue oxygenation when started early. This is something we found in this study with uh, Jean-Francois Georgère in the past. We looked at the STU to tissue oxygen saturation effect with uh, uh, the nearest device and we had a better STU2 when we gave norepinephrine and also a better recovery slope of STU2 confirming, suggesting that we can have a better uh, tissue oxygenation and a better recruitment of microvessels when given early again. And finally, it may improve outcome. This is a study by Gustavo Spinatascon showing that the cumulative mortality on the y-axis also was lower in those patients who receive norepinephrine early. It is not a randomized study. It is a retrospective analysis. And this is a randomized study performed in a single center in Thailand. And the primary outcome was not mortality, but a combine, a combine, uh, f a combine uh, variable, a sheave target MAP plus uh, improvement of a tissue perfusion uh, goal by six hours after resuscitation. And the, there was a better shock control rate with early norepinephrine in this uh, study. And also less complications, less cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and less new onset of cardiac arrhythmia. And this was confirmed by this meta-analysis published last year. Less mortality when norepinephrine is given early. And this is also a recommendation coming from the ESICM and many of uh, the people uh, on, my, on my left uh, participated in these uh, recommendations. Vasopressors should be started early before completion of real resuscitation. It was a reasonable consensus between 70 and 80 percent experts agreed we had 34 uh, experts in this uh, recommendation. So my, my conclusion, of course, is that we can have benefits of norepinephrine. It can rapidly correct hypotension. It can increase cardiac output when started early through an increase in cardiac preload, through an increase in cardiac contractility. And the early combination of fluids and norepinephrine makes sense because it can improve the clinical situation. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jean-Louis, for a very elegant uh, presentation, as usual. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, especially in a period like this, we've never had such a difficulty sometimes in having a free ICU bed available. Co to, it's very difficult sometimes to have a free ICU bed available. And you show some data about the early use of vasopressors. If you see a patient in the ward that uh, is hypotensive, do you start... Uh, with fluids there, or considering what you told us, would you start peripheral infusion of vasopressor, which is a topic we've not it, touched yet? It depends on the severity of hypotension, of course. Everything depends on the severity of hypotension. When MAP is uh, 62, the situation is totally different uh, compared to MAP 45, <laughs> of course. So if it is very severe, I will start with fluid plus norepinephrine even with a peripheral access. If it is between 60 and 65, I could transfer the patient to the ICU and insert a, a, a central venous catheter. It depends on the severity of shock. And uh, one last question. You show some uh, collateral effects of uh, norepinephrine, which are good, increasing cardiac output and so on. But I guess we still use mean arterial pressure or perfusion pressure as our targets. Or do you also look at cardiac output increases and do you target your infusion source according to that? No, I use all the, I try to integrate all the variables, of course, 
the target for norepinephrine is clearly MAP and DAP. DAP is a trigger when DAP is low. Those diastolic arterial pressure, sorry. When diastolic arterial pressure is low, for me, it's the marker of vasculotone in the majority of cases, and I start norepinephrine. This is a good indication to start. And the target is MAP for the combination of fluid and norepinephrine, but the target is uh, blood flow, perfusion markers uh, for, for the combined treatment, of course. Thank you. Okay, thank you thank very you. much, John so now it gives a uh, great pleasure to invite Francois Lomontagne from Sherbrooke in Canada to speak. Uh, we have been communicating almost on a weekly basis as part of Remap Camp for the last 18 months, so it's a great pleasure to see you in person. So Francois, over to you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to see you as well. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for being here. Thanks for the, this invitation, and I'd like to thank the organizers for pulling this off. It's a quite amazing feat. Um, so I wish, uh, I wish uh, Professor Teboul um, uh, had arrived a bit later. I would have liked to go first. It's a bit intimidating to <laughs> speak after uh, he presents on the benefits of vasopressors. I am tasked with um, addressing the risks of vasopressor therapy. Um, so I have no financial disclosures, obviously, but I have opinions. I've been spending a number of years evaluating, uh, studying the risks of these medications, so I've got opinions, uh, so maybe an academic bias. But I, I did put on the slide here that I'm first and foremost a clinician. I, I want you to know that. I work in a very small university hospital in Canada. We don't have ICU fellows, so I spend most of my days and nights inserting lines, administering vasopressors. Um, and I say this because like, I'm not going to dispute uh, the fact that low blood pressure is bad. I'm sure that patients with low blood pressure have a greater risk of dying. My question is, would vasopressors really improve their outcomes? That's where I am less certain. And despite this, I am, I am using vasopressors on a regular basis, as you all are. My objectives here are modest. They're only to, to perhaps move the dial ever so slightly uh, and, and, and collectively you know, get us to consider the disadvantages and the risks of vasopressor therapy um, uh, in treating low blood pressure. And I, I would like to do this by discussing with you three types of risks or risks that I would categorize in, in, in three categories. So those things that are unmeasurable uh, that we don't really measure or hardly even suspect at the bedside. Those things, you know, those pleiotropic effects of vasopressors. And then there are those risks that are measurable, the, the vascular effects, the macro, the microvascular effects of vasopressors. So definitely measurable, not always measured, but measurable, uh, and potentially harmful, but of unknown clinical significance. And then the, the overall impact, which you know, should be measurable in a, in a clinical trial, the overall impact on mortality. And towards the end, in the last few minutes, um, I'd like to examine with you what usual care really is and, and discuss whether there is reason for concern um, by looking at what, what we do day in and day out with vasopressors. So, other people at this meeting are probably, not probably, are far more qualified than I am to discuss these things, the quote-unquote pleiotropic effects of these medications, which really are hormones. By definition, you know, these hormones have a wide array of effects uh, that go beyond, you know, what we want to achieve when we administer these drugs. Uh, they basically affect every organ system. Um, significantly, now, whether this translates into clinical, you know, uh, uh, effect on mortality is unknown, but it is, it is still uh, a reason to be cautious. Now, we don't have time to go through all of the, um, you know, the list of these um, things that uh, Martin Dunzer and Professor Singer have discussed very eloquently in these papers that I, that I highly recommend, but I, I, I would like to highlight perhaps the effect of these medications on the immune system. Uh, every aspect of the innate uh, and adaptive immune system is affected by catecholamines, uh, mostly the mo most commonly used vasopressors. And, you know, largely these effects, in vitro at least, are immunosuppressive. Catecholamines are associated with lymphopenia. Uh, they reduce the phagocytic ability or capacity of neutrophils and macrophages. 
um, they, um, they, uh, and, and in parallel, they increase the growth and the virulence of bacteria. So this, these are, you know, very counterintuitive effects in, in, in patients uh, who are, you know, desperately trying to ward off infection and, and, and recovering from, from sepsis, for example, a population where we commonly use vasopressors. Um, so whether this, this, this is really uh, uh, clinically meaningful is unclear, but at least it, it is a, a reason to, to wonder. The catecholamines and, and other vasopressors also impact the clotting system. They, they, they increase pretty significantly platelet aggregation and degranulation. Um, and so, again, another, another reason to perhaps be concerned that, that everything that we are not measuring when we're giving these drugs may not be uh, benefiting our patients. Now, whether this translates clinically into, you know, actual clots is unclear, but in, in large cohort studies and in, in reviews of large cohort studies, vasopressor administration has been pretty consistently associated with more thrombosis. Uh, and that could be via a direct effect. Uh, it could be by inducing skin vasoconstriction and reducing the bioavailability of, of heparin that we give to, to prevent clots. Who knows? But it is, and it, it could not even be causal. It could just be a, 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 an association because sicker patients tend to get clots, but still another reason to perhaps be mindful that these things aren't uh, benign. So those, those are about the, the pleiotropic effects, and we could go on and on and talk about uh, muscle apoptosis and the potential impact on long-term uh, functional outcomes, but, but we would quickly run out of time. So I, I'd like now to examine the, the vascular effects of the vasopressors. Um, so we're giving these things presumably because we want to increase perfusion. Professor Tebul has, you know, eloquently presented that below a certain point, if, if blood pressure is low enough, uh, a perfusion will, will drop. Uh, I, I attended a very interesting session yesterday where uh, experts, microcirculatory experts, you know, talked about the disconnect between the macrovascular uh, um, uh, um, uh, elements and the microcirculation. It's quite unclear to me that um, vasopressors will actually increase blood flow at the microcirculatory level if you uh, increase blood pressure by inducing intense vasoconstriction. Basic physiology tells us that, you know, the radius of the vessel probably matters more than the pressure gradient, and, and, and it is still um, uh, unclear. We, we could actually have the opposite effect and uh, reducing uh, blood flow at the microcirculatory level. The other question, you know, that we probably should be asking is, is the perfusion even decreased in the first place? Particularly in distributive shock states, in patients that have been minimally resuscitated, um, when you go through the trouble, microcirculation is measurable. It's not often measured at the bedside, but uh, in instances where it has been measured by uh, Dr. Dubin and colleagues, uh, it, it, it seldom is as low as we think in spite of the low blood pressure values. Certainly this is something that we found uh, when we measured by taking septic patients who had been resuscitated for about a day to the MRI bay and measured cerebral perfusion uh, by means of arterial spin labeling, a special MRI uh, technique. Patients who were septic and minimally resuscitated had far greater uh, brain perfusion than um, healthy control subjects. So I don't think that in the face of low blood pressure, perfusion is always as decreased as we think it is. But set aside, you know, whether vasopressors actually increase perfusion at the microcirculatory level, whether we even need to increase uh, blood flow at the microcirculatory level. What is certain is that if you give enough of these medications, you can harm someone. Consider for an instant a healthy heart, and then a failing heart, and then a hypertrophic, hyperdynamic heart. Even a, a healthy heart, if you give a big enough dose, you know, you, you potentially would harm the myocardium. The catecholamines are at the root of what we know about stress-induced cardiomyopathy, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, and the, the, cardio, uh, the cardiac injury associated with, you know, neurological catastrophes. It's potentially not the only factor, but they certainly play a role. So if you can, if you can damage a heart by giving enough catecholamine, consider what we do when we treat a patient with a failing LV. So I'm thinking here of the 
systolic left ventricular failure, a patient who has low ejection fraction either chronically or acutely in the context of sepsis. So, you know, if, if you're going to treat for a, a patient like this on the ward or as an outpatient, the first line therapy is to reduce afterload so that the failing heart manages to eject a sufficient amount of blood at a lower, you know, energy cost. And yet, here we are in the ICU, the minute we see a patient like this, we shower them with agents that have both beta-1 and, you know, alpha-1 effects, but we drastically increase afterload. So whatever we do to the cardiac output, it's at the cost of a, you know, considerable energy expenditure. And so I question whether that is, you know, really the effect that we're aiming for that, you know, we should achieve knowing, you know, what, what, what milrinone cures have done to, in, in the heart failure population. And then an, an, perhaps an underestimated, you know, macrovascular effect of these medications is what we do to the heart that is hyperdynamic and stiff and thick. Um, like, you know, chronic hypertension is not a rare disease. A, a large number of our patients are chronically hypertensive. You, you echo their hearts, they're stiff, um, patients with, you know, chronic aortic stenosis. These patients might be completely comfortable at home taking their beta blockers with, like, they probably don't have a, a, a sub-aortic um, uh, outflow tract obstruction, but take them to the ICU in the context of, you know, sepsis, their heart rate increases, they're febrile, they're vasodilated, uh, give them a drug that accelerates their heart, and, you know, norepinephrine has a significant beta-1 effect, the, the filling time reduces to the extent that, you know, it might be too little for the heart to fill. And norepinephrine is, it's something that's been mostly described with dobutamine, but norepinephrine will, in those patients that with enough cardiac hypertrophy, be associated and cause uh, dynamic uh, left ventricular tra tract obstruction. And, you know, on top of that, you know, increases the risk of um, atrial fibrillation, take away their atrial kick. So, we don't know what it does to the microcirculatory perfusion. If that's why we're giving vasopressors, we don't even know we need to increase it. We don't know that these drugs really do increase the microcirculatory uh, flow. But we know that, at least in some patients, there are definite measurable downsides to these drugs. Now, I'm here talking about all these, uh, you know, theoretic risks, and, and you're probably thinking and wondering, well, you know, if it were... If, if these things were so dangerous, we'd know about it, right? Well, would we? Because the reality is that we've been using these things for over 100 years without really rigorously addressing their overall effects on mortality. We, we've never studied this the way we would, um, you know, we, the way we would study a new drug uh, like tocilizumab or, or, you know, in the context of COVID. Um, so we, we, we've, not, we've not compared this to placebo, and I'm not saying we should, uh, but the whole point is we might not know about the overall uh, risks uh, to these drugs. The first, you know, to, to really challenge um, the risks and benefits with more intense versus less intense vasopressor therapy was Pierre Asfar uh, in the sepsis PAM trial. Uh, we followed with a, a, small trial, a small pilot study in Canada, and, and of late uh, with... Uh, uh, Paul Nouncey, Kathy Rowe, and other friends at ICNARC, and, and, and Tony, who's here, uh, the, the 65 trial uh, did the same. Now this, I know, you know, th these were not blood pressure uh, uh, trials as much as they were trials uh, um, aiming to assess whether the overall benefits of a more intense therapy outweighed the risks of a more intense vasopressor therapy. Now, in these trials, and these are the only randomized controlled trials of intense versus less intense vasopressor therapy, you'll notice that if you line these trials up on a forest plot, they're all on the same side of the no effect line. They're all to the left. They all point to a trend suggesting that less intense vasopressor therapy is beneficial. Now, whether or not these are individually statistically significant or together statistically significant is sort of beside the point, but there has not been overwhelming evidence suggesting that they are more beneficial than harmful or that giving more is more beneficial than harmful. And like, I know these studies mixed a lot of uh, different patients, uh, but we were unable to pick out an, any subgroup of patient who seems to derive more benefits. So it's not like the chronically hypertensive patients seem to do better 
they don't seem to do better. So the fact that we, we cannot pick out one group that particularly benefits more uh, is again uh, a reason to pause and examine whether uh, we are using too much of these drugs. Remember, I'm talking about the intensity here, not the timing. I would not dispute the fact that if you use them, timing, timing uh, might be of the essence. Now, having discussed all these risks, it could be irrelevant, right? Because if we're not using a lot of those things, if we're not using them frequently, then it, it's irrelevant. But I guess my point here is that we are using these drugs quite liberally. So what is usual care? I think it, it might be quite different from what we think it is. There might be, there is, I think, a disconnect between whatever we order, what we prescribe, uh, and what is delivered to the patient. These three figures illustrate uh, you know, the protocol adherence uh, to each of the three trials that I mentioned, sepsis PAM, uh, our small ovation trial, and, and lately the 65 trial. Now, the, the yellowish uh, horizontal bars there might not be very visible, but they, they illustrate the range that was targeted in the conservative arms of these trials. And you can see that the actual blood pressure values were always rather consistently above that range, suggesting that this, this is whatever we think, like we might be talking about how blood pressure isn't the end point, it's perfusion. In real life, nurses will titrate these drugs to MAP levels. And it's entrenched in our DNA that blood pressure is bad, and it probably is. What we don't know is if the drug to treat blood pressure is better <laughs> than the hypotension itself, but it's so entrenched that it is that alarms are only set at the lower end of that uh, blood pressure range. N we never set the uh, alarm above the range. And therefore, this, this sort of naturally leads us to, 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 to overtreat or overuse vasopressors, which is, I think, consistently, even in the context of clinical trials, considerably above what we might think we're doing. Now, very recently with a graduate student, we, we did another trial comparing conservative therapy to, um, to usual care, and we wanted to know whether beginning the trial would impact usual care. So this was a methodological piece, if you will. Um, and so we were happy to see that usual care was the same six months before the trial in those eight centers, and it remained the same during the trial. So the fact that we did the trial did not change usual care, which was a concern of ours. But you can see that, and this was, you know, therefore outside the trial, Usual care, you know, patients while they're getting vasopressors have much higher blood pressure values than what we'd like to admit, higher blood pressure values than what is actually prescribed in the, in the medical chart. So perhaps there is reason for concern here. So on balance, I'm not trying to convince you to stop using these drugs. You could use them early. Like, as I said, the, the whole idea was to move the dial a little bit and, and so that, you know, we are all collectively conscious that there are risks. Um, and even though there might not be irrefutable proof that the harms clearly statistically significantly outweigh the benefits, I wonder whether we should apply the same threshold to adopt a more conservative approach to these things as we would if we were testing a new drug. Like, I do believe we should set a pretty high threshold before we start giving a new expensive drug which could have side effects. But if this is about de-adopting something that is potentially harmful, question should be posed whether we, we need to be as, uh, as uh, we need, we, whether we need to expect, you know, or set the same uh, threshold to, to change our, our ways. So anyway, I'm, I'm a strong believer that the same way we, 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 we are uh, more scrupulous in how we administer antibiotics these days, we could start talking or thinking in terms of vasopressors stewardship as well for the same reasons. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. Um, I don't know if we're doing questions from the audience. Uh, I know there are no microphones, but it, does anybody have a question? Um, you may need to just shout uh, loudly. Question? Or just moving seat. Just move. So I have a question, Francois. Can you give... I thought I was off the... Uh, okay. no, 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 not quite so easy. Can you give us any more uh, practical advice? As a clinician, since you saw the 65 trial, how... How have you implemented, has it changed anything you do at the bedside? Because you said it, you can set a target of 65 or 60, but the nurses will aim above that because they don't want to go below it. 
but often you'll achieve above 70. So how do you control yeah. it? So what do you do? Well, I mean, I think the last presenter in this session will talk about, you know, automated uh, vasopressor or drip uh, titration of vasopressor drips. And, you know, until, until we, we, we have tools that, that, you know, take the human factor out of the equation the way uh, yesterday there were interesting uh, presentations about uh, automated um, uh, oxygen flow uh, titration. Until we get there, I think this is, this is knowledge translation. This is education. This is training. Um, so a lot of it is, is you know, speaking to the, the, the other side of the story, like the other side of the, <laughs> the double-edged uh, double sword, and, and that there are, it, clearly there are risks if blood pressure, you know, drops to very low levels, but there could be a risk to, to letting these things, you know, trend upward. And so, uh, you know, talking about setting two alarms, perhaps alarms for, you know, blood pressures that are higher. So these, these more conservative approach clearly aren't less work. They're more work. They require more monitoring because if you're going to try to reduce the overall vasopressor load, you can't just, you know, allow the patient to just remain on the ward and, and you know, you have to monitor and make sure the blood pressure doesn't drop to, to, to levels that are dangerous. And so setting two alarms is basically more work. A lot of this is education and, and, and training. Great. Thank you. I think we have a question. I don't think there are microphones as far as I can tell. Maybe we're not allowed to pass them to each other. I don't know. For, well, the, Francois, when you reply, yeah. without repeating it, can you imply yeah. what the so question the, was? The idea is um, there are the two different questions. Uh, what is the ideal blood pressure uh, threshold is one question, and whether norepinephrine is deleterious is another question. Um, and so what, what, is, what, what comments do I have? Like, so the, the rationale for the studies I led uh, was this microcirculatory, you know, that the, the, there is a disconnect between the blood pressure value and the microcirculatory flow. The, the first trial I wanted to do was one of vasodilators in septic shock. I was challenged by my mentors to say, great, but, you know, the nurses aren't, you know, measuring uh, kidney flow using echo enhanced uh, or contrast enhanced echo um, ultrasound and so they are titrating these things by you know following blood pressure values so before you start giving vasodilators why don't you figure out what the what the how how low you can go how safe it is so if you're going to start giving any kind of vasodilator at which point you need to counteract that effect with the vasopressor that was the rationale behind the six, eventually the 65 trial. I agree there are different questions, but some of this, the reason we conducted blood pressure targeted, you know, vasopressor management is to try to move away actually from the blood pressure targets and trying to explore with the drugs that are commonly used, what is safe. And, and, and so it is sort of a uh, pragmatically taking into consideration what the nurses actually use to titrate these drugs. But I agree there are different okay. questions. Thank you, Francois. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. And uh, it's time to introduce the next speaker, Professor Jan Bakker, now from uh, New York. And Ia is going to talk about permissive hypotension. Thank you very much um, for the introduction. Um, I'm very happy that Francois was the previous speaker because he help to, uh, let's say, get out of this whole blood pressure stuff. Uh, Jean-Louis and Dania will be shocked, of course, but remember, we do this many times, and, um, and um, I know they're shocked. So it's about permissive hypotension. But remember, a blood pressure of 65 is hypotension. We have a goal, 65, and so when you follow the guidelines and you have your patient stable on 65, the patient is stable, is still hypotensive. Okay, no uh, uh, problems uh, with uh, conflict of interest. So there are two problems. One is the problem of shock. And when we defined shock, when we had this consensus uh, meeting, we said, well, uh, the definition of shock is that um, it's a life-threatening, generalized form of circulatory failure associated with inadequate oxygen utilization by the cells, and as a result, there is cellular dysoxia. Note that there is no blood pressure here. We didn't talk about shock is hypotension. 
And so there is this shock element that is related to cellular dysoxia and generalized acute circulatory failure and inadequate oxygen utilization. That's the element of shock that we thought was uh, uh, relevant a long time ago, um, but still not uh, changed. And then there's the aspect of refractory. And refractory is a shock where you have refractory tissue oxygenation problems. So whatever you're doing to the patient, you do not resolve the tissue hypoxia or the tissue uh, uh, oxygenation. And that's the key element of refractory. And that refractory is also in blood pressure. So when Jean-Louis showed the graph of um, the time uh, uh, where your mean arterial pressure is less than 65, is relevant for outcome, of course it is, because if you want the patient to be above 65, but you can't, then of course your patient is more sick and is more likely to die. If the, if the nurses want 75 as a blood pressure, but they can get there and they increase norepinephrine, and increase, increase, uh, your patient is more likely to die. So there's this element of what is shock and there's this element of refractory. Okay, what are the markers of tissue hypoxia that we can use to titrate mean arterial pressure if we think the blood pressure is a problem? Well, traditionally, that's lactate. We use lactate as an indicator of tissue hypoxia. And then we have, um, no, that's it. At the bedside, we have nothing more to, um, to, let's say, indicate that there is a metabolic problem that could be related to low oxygen delivery. And it's related to these uh, studies that we did uh, a lot. Uh, when I was in Brussels, we did these studies, and it's a concept of, uh, of having a, a decrease in oxygen consumption, and in a stable, um, uh, uh, in this case, dog, that means that the dog uh, doesn't um, consume oxygen from baseline, and so basically there's tissue hypoxia because nothing has changed in oxygen demand, and then you see lactate go up. And in another element, and in another study, Haibo Zhang showed that if you show, if you uh, um, bring the dog into a shock state by tamponade, and then you remove the tamponade that the patient, that the, uh, the animal goes into shock, starts to produce lactate. If you move the dog back by removing the tamponade, he comes back to baseline. So from these, uh, um, uh, studies, it seems that indeed lactate could be a good indicator of tissue hypoxia. But that's only, that's it. And there's a lot of uh, pros and cons for lactate. And if you come to the lactate presentation this afternoon, uh, I will show you that it's much more difficult than we think. And so we use markers of tissue perfusion to aim for cardiac output, mean arterial pressure and stuff like that. Aha, and that's much better because we have much more indicators of tissue perfusion than for tissue hypoxia. And one is, uh, we think, mean arterial pressure. But please, um, stop. I, I'm not interested in mean arterial pressure. And that's, of course, an overstatement because very low blood pressure is not good. Um, but I will give you some let's say, ideas on how I use blood pressure. If you look at lactate or blood pressure, so isolated increased lactate or isolated hypotension, then give me hypotension. Because if you have isolated lactate, that's not good. In whatever condition, lactate is always a bad signal, whereas low blood pressure is, I mean, uh, there's still mortality, 12%, uh, but it's almost double when you only have lactate with a without hypotension. So if you want a signal, something is wrong with my patient, I need to do something, then probably lactate is better than uh, mean arterial pressure. The problem with mean arterial pressure is, it's of course incredibly easy to measure, uh, but there's hardly any shock without hypotension. And um, if the mean arterial pressure doesn't increase, while well, you want to increase it, so you start norepinephrine, nothing happens. You increase nor norepinephrine, nothing happens. That's a bad thing. These patients are in a bad situation and much more likely to die 
then when the blood pressure immediately it comes up when you give norepinephrine. And if the mean arterial pressure is decreasing rapidly, call the troops. Your patient is in trouble. Uh, and these are what we sometimes call flatliners. Sometimes within minutes, they have cardiac arrest and you need to resuscitate. And so there is a lot of information in, uh, a, lacta in a mean arterial pressure uh, signal. But remember, in physiology, we do not manipulate our pressure to change organ perfusion. When we want to change organ perfusion because we need to, we vasodilate. Vasodilation is the way we create increases in organ perfusion, not increasing mean arterial pressure, because otherwise, if you start to exercise, we would explode, or we would have a tentorial herniation and die. Uh, and so we don't manipulate blood pressure. Uh, the only thing we do is we vasodilate. And this, this let's, say, um, uh, let's say, huge attention for blood pressure in giving um, vasopressors, uh, that's an old problem. And already in the 60s, um, uh, Cohn showed that in these cardiogenic shock patients where they, they had this uh, uh, strong vasopressors to create the blood pressure, giving fluids instead of um, a vasopressor was much better. And uh, Max Ariwal already said, uh, following all of these, uh, his studies, mainly in cardiogenic shock, the basic mechanism is a reduction in flow, not a reduction in pressure. And the, the thinking is that um, if you decrease blood pressure, uh, because of vasodilation, so basically the sepsis model, that you decrease perfusion pressure of the microcirculation, and that's not really true. So if you drop your blood pressure because of vasodilation, this is your mean arterial pressure, then the entry pressure for your microcirculation increases. So this is the vasodilatory state. This is the entry pressure in your microcirculation. If you vasoconstrict, you reduce it to almost zero, and that's why you get this cold skin. That's why you get this discoloration of the skin, the blue, uh, the mottling, uh, because of um, the, the uh, significant decrease in entry pressure to your microcirculation. But if you vasodilate, it improves. Another element of uh, a microcirculatory perfusion is frequently forgotten. We think that mean arterial pressure is the entry pressure, which is it. It's not because there's a stalling resistor that needs to vasodilate. That's how we manipulate uh, blood flow. Uh, we frequently forget that the um, uh, post-capillary pressure and the surrogate is the central venous pressure affects microcirculatory perfusion as well. And of course, different organs have different relationships between pressure and flow. And the kidney is the worst. So if a patient pees, and the blood pressure drops and the patient stops peeing, that's a bad sign. If the patient doesn't pee, the only way to find out if the mean arterial pressure is not <laughs> adequate enough is to increase blood pressure and see what's happening. Uh, the problem is that with all these, uh, uh, let's say, physiological relationships, they're very true, but you can't use them at the bedside. It's extremely difficult to do something about the blood pressure and see if the gut perfusion improves. That's basically impossible. Um, but for the kidney, at least, that's, we have a signal, urine production. And if you have a hypoperfusion context, so let's say parameters of perfusion that are low in the context of lactate as a marker of tissue hypoxia in the early phase in this uh, study in, uh, in septic shock, uh, if you have these markers, so a low SCVO2, which is a perfusion marker, a low delta PCO2, arterial to uh, venous to arterial CO2 different, or capillary refill time, if you have this hypoperfusion context, then uh, um, um, the patient is worse. There is more organ failure, uh, there's more um, mechanical ventilation days, uh, and there's more rescue uh, therapy. The p-values are not significant, but they uh, show, uh, let's say, the same direction. So the, the presence of hypoperfusion and a marker of tissue hypoxia is even worse. 
And why is hypoperfusion, why are these markers of tissue hypoxia related to perfusion and important? This is a study we did with uh, 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 Brunauer and Martin Dunzer. We measured capillary refill time and we measured the uh, perfusion of the liver, the kidney, the intestine, and the spleen with echo. Um, and a higher uh, resistance index is a lower flow. And so the higher your capillary refill time, so the more vasoconstriction, the lower the perfusion of the liver, kidney, intestine, and spleen. And so capillary um, uh, refill time can serve as a surrogate for perfusion of organs. And so refractory shock is a state in which parameters of tissue perfusion in patients with abnormal lactate levels, because that's almost always present in every shock patient, um, and initial hypotension, and they do not respond to treatment. That's the real problem. And then you can have inadequate cardiac output. You can have inadequate mean arterial pressure. You can have a high, a too high central venous pressure. And, and that's the most cases, you have a combination of all three. And so the first question, is my treatment goal adequate? <clears throat> and as for Francois already said, uh, nurses like to have high blood pressure. Uh, they're very happy with 70, 75, and if it's 80, it's even better. So if you want to keep your patient at a very low blood pressure, and I will show you what my lower limit is uh, somewhat later, um, what I do is I walk into the room of the patient every 30 minutes to make sure that the blood pressure is at the level I want it to be and to support the nurse in accepting something that is completely out of their comfort zone. And if there is a real problem and I don't have time to walk in, I ask the nurse, what's your comfort level? And if the nurse says, I'm comfortable with 65, then don't try 45. You're in trouble. It will never work. Um, and so then uh, the, the second question is my treatment. Uh, um, effective. And if you don't know, stress the system. That's what we used in the Andromeda 1 study. We introduced the vasopressor test. If you are unsure about organ perfusion and you have a parameter of organ perfusion, whatever the parameter is, then increase the blood pressure. Give more norepinephrine, increase the blood pressure to 80 to 85. That's what we used in the Andromeda 1 study, and that's what we will use in Andromeda 2 as well. And see whether this perfusion parameter improves. If it improves, then keep it. Um, if the patients start peeing with 80, 85, great. Um, if the lactate drops with 80, 85, great. Uh, so you have to stress the system. And then you get into trouble because that requires resources. That requires a lot of time. That may require you to stay in the room. And so it's, uh, it's not an easy test, but it's a logical way to find the best uh, uh, blood pressure. And remember, it's not only patients with previous hypertension that might benefit from a higher blood pressure. This is the study by uh, Arnaldo Dubin, already uh, shown by, uh, by Francois. <laughs> Uh, he showed that if you have low capillary perfusion, microcirculatory perfusion, an increase in blood pressure might improve microcirculatory perfusion in any patient. So I always stress the system if I think or if I have evidence that there is abnormal perfusion. And so if you want to, uh, let's say, resuscitate your patient, you have to have a holistic view. It's not only blood pressure, it's not only cardiac output, it's not only central venous pressure, it's not only lactate, it's a combination of all these factors. If all these perfusion factors are normal, or let's say acceptable, adequate, I have no pr uh, problem with the blood pressure of 45 of mean. And we have gathered many patients with blood pressures of 45 that do fine, even patients with 45 that talk to you and make jokes in septic shock. And remember, that's still hypotension. They never leave the unit with 45, but it doesn't mean that they're inadequate. It's a rare thing. We don't have a lot of patients that do well with 45, but you have some. Um, and this is what we wrote already a long time ago. So in conclusion, 
Blood pressure measurements always need to be put in context. It's not a number that you treat, it's the patient that you treat. Um, and you have to create a context, like is this, is this good, is it bad? And this can be as simple as observing that the patient's overall function is normal, or in complex situations by obtaining measurements of blood flow and metabolic indicators like lactate. Refractory shock refers to a state where you cannot correct the tissue oxygenation or the tissue perfusion. We have no absolute parameter for uh, oxygenation and that's why we use perfusion. And persistent abnormality of flow sensitive parameters is associated with a very bad outcome. Um, and as flow parameters, you can use all of these. And if you're unclear, if you don't know, stress the system and find out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. I think there is uh, time for only one question before we move on. If there isn't one from the audience, I'm going to ask a very practical one. So for me, it's about uh, trying to be low, but still within the range of autoregulation. I mean, you mentioned about this 40, 45, which is uh, probably a rare case. But considering that there is also what we do, sometimes are not immediate. You know, the outcomes are something that we see or the damage and the complications are something that we see, you know, days later or weeks later. Practically, how low do you go when you have a patient with shock in the emergency room or in the ward? Well, that's, that's an interesting point. Uh, do you start with 45? Let's, let's say, let's take the, uh, the extreme. Do you start with 45 and then, uh, okay, well, let's see what happens? No, never. I never have a patient with 45 in an emergency room or on a floor. And so what we said in the consensus is um, when, we, uh, when we had a pro con discussion in the Journal of Critical Care, we finally said, because we couldn't agree, let's get the patient to 65 and take it from there. And then in some patients you go up, and in some patients you can go down while they maintain their organ perfusion. Thank you, Jan. Okay, thank you. We're now going to move on and discuss uh, the effects of vasopressors on individual organs and situations. And we start with uh, Jacques Duranteau, who's going to uh, speak about what is best for the kidney. Thanks a lot. <coughs> so, <coughs> what is uh, the best for the kidney? Um, if we, we try to, uh, to fix what is the good strategy for kidney? We can say that uh, it's good to avoid uh, tissue perfusion, good to maintain uh, glomerular filtration. And uh, so it's, uh, uh, in my point of view, it's good uh, to maintain arterial pressure and uh, stroke volume. And most likely with uh, an individual approach, and uh, taking care of uh, the preservation of renal pressure and taking care of uh, the pressure in the right ventricle. So are vasopressors useful in this strategy and which vasopressors uh, are useful in this strategy? So uh, are vasopressors useful to prevent uh, uh, kidney function? This first study, I like this study because it's during uh, surgery, post-operative uh, uh, acute kidney injury, and uh, so they, uh, in this study, two harm. The first harm is a standard treatment where the physician tried just to prevent uh, any uh, decrease of systolic arterial pressure lower uh, than uh, 80 uh, meters of mercury or a decrease of more than 4% uh, of the patient reference value. And a second strategy where we, you, they try to target systolic arterial pressure by giving uh, continuous uh, norepinephrine infusion and uh, to try to target the systolic arterial pressure within 10% of the reference value. There is a lot of hypertensive patient in this study and it's important to consider. And in parallel, there is an optimization of the stroke volume. And what they observe, looking at the acute kidney injury 
at, uh, sorry, at uh, the seven days, they observe a decrease in the number of acute kidney injuries. So clearly for me, it's a sign that uh, vasopressor are helpful to prevent acute kidney injury. So which vasopressor is the best to do this? So uh, there is uh, only a few study on uh, vasopressor and kidney and a few uh, preclinical study, few clinical study. So there is a lot of question uh, to be solved, but traditionally norepinephrine act at the level of pregromerular arteriole inducing a vasoconstriction with an improvement of blood flow to the renal cortex and medulla uh, don't, but uh, there is still discussion about the dose dependent distribution uh, in, uh, with norepinephrine. Concerning vasopressin, possible uh, preferential vasoconstriction of uh, the post-glomerular arteriole resulting an, in an increase in uh, glomerular filtration. Angiotensin II has a stronger uh, vasoconstrictive effect on the post-glomerular arterial tone with also a potential beneficial effect on the glomerular filtration. So uh, I want to share with you some uh, preclinical data and uh, clinical data. Uh, this result from uh, my lab where we, uh, in uh, rats, uh, we induce uh, an uh, hemorrhagic shock. It's a pressure control hemorrhage. And after we try to uh, compare uh, the uh, infusion of norepinephrine or infusion of vasopressin or fluid resuscitation alone, uh, looking at uh, the kidney and using the contrast enhanced uh, ultrasound imaging uh, to uh, look at, at the cortex and the medulla. What you can see in this study is that we uh, induce shock and uh, after recitation with norepinephrine, arginine, vasopressin, or uh, with uh, fluid alone, and after we transfuse the, the animals. What we observe at the, the kidney is that uh, concerning the recovery during resuscitation, we observe that when we use a vasopressor, we were able uh, to restore uh, the uh, cortex uh, uh, circulation and the medulla circulation with maybe a more efficient uh, effect with uh, vasopressin, but a very transient effect because after transfusion, there is no difference between norepinephrine, between vasopressin, and between uh, fluid uh, alone. But uh, there is what is important is that norepinephrine or arginine vasopressin associated with fluid resuscitation induce no deleterious effect on the cortex or medulla circulation. In septic uh, animals, I like this, uh, uh, this study and uh, this model because it's a very, uh, a very uh, in my point of view, a very good model. So they induce uh, in uh, uh, conscious sheep, they induce by inducing uh, E. coli, uh, um, an hyperdynamic shock. Uh, they uh, infuse during a 24 hour E. coli and what they observe, they observe uh, an increase in cardiac output, a decrease in mean arterial pressure. And uh, at the level of the kidney, it's induced uh, an uh, alteration of uh, the uh, clearance creatinine about 50% uh, and the same about uh, urine output and the same about uh, the fractional sodium uh, excretion. And uh, so they, in this study, they compare the effect of norepinephrine and uh, arginine vasopressin. And uh, what they observe, they observe that norepinephrine was more able 
to improve the stroke volume than arginine vasopressin, but it's not the very interesting result uh, because what is the first point which is very important is to see that in this model there is an increase in the renal blood flow despite the fact that you have a decrease in kidney function. So when they induce, uh, they introduce the vasopressor, they observe that the arginine vasopressin had an e effect uh, on uh, the renal blood flow uh, and uh, norepinephrine no effect, uh, but there is a preservation of uh, the circulation in uh, the cortex, even if arginine vasopressin uh, uh, increased better uh, the, uh, the flow than norepinephrine. And what was interesting is that there is a deep decrease in the perfusion of medulla in this model. And it's why, despite the increase in renal blood flow, the decrease in uh, medulla blood flow explain why you have an uh, alteration of the kidney function. And what they observe with arginine vasopressin, there is at the level it's a transient, it's during two hours, there is an improvement with the arginine vasopressin of the flow at the medullary level with an improvement, a more sustained improvement of oxygenation at the level of the medullary. And in parallel, there is a better restoration of the kidney function with arginine vasopressin in comparison uh, to norepinephrine. In human, uh, this uh, famous study, the VAST study, where they try to uh, compare, uh, the, uh, to uh, test the effect of low dose of vasopressin in patients in septic shock receiving a minimum of five micrograms of norepinephrine per minute. And uh, the goal was uh, to uh, prove that it could decrease the mortality. Uh, globally, there is no decrease in the mortality except in one group, the group where they give, uh, the uh, group where they have a less severe septic shock with a lower uh, concentration of norepinephrine. In this group, they observe a decrease in mortality when they add uh, the vasopressin. And uh, uh, concerning the kidney, when they uh, reanalyze uh, the data, so in a postdoc analysis of this uh, uh, trial, they observe that in this group, they uh, taking, considering the uh, risk patient, uh, uh, consider using the referral classification about acute kidney injury, they observe that fewer patients progress to renal failure or loss in this group when they add the arginine vasopressin. So maybe, and uh, it's uh, interesting to see this like this, maybe high concentration of norepinephrine could be maybe deleterious for kidney. Uh, it's not the only explanation, there is other explanation, but I just want to put this uh, in front just for the discussion. So, uh, and uh, Gordon uh, followed by uh, uh, the study where they tried to introduce uh, immediately uh, va arginine vasopressin or norepinephrine. And uh, uh, the primary endpoint was the kidney failure three days uh, during 28 uh, days period. And what they observed, they observed no difference. No difference between arginine vasopressin and norepinephrine. Nephrine, despite the fact that uh, arginine vasopressin, the group where they introduce immediately arginine vasopressin, they use less norepinephrine. And uh, uh, if uh, they, they, um, you consider the serum creatinine level, it was lower with a slight effect on urine output when they use uh, uh, vasopressin. And, uh, uh, the, an important result is the rate of renal uh, replacement therapy, even if the use of renal replacement therapy was not controlled in this study, there is a, a, a decrease in the number of patients who had renal replacement therapy with the vasopressin group. 
Uh, another study, a very, in my point of view, very important study. It's not in septic shock, it's in uh, vasoplegic shock after cardiac surgery. And uh, so uh, they test uh, uh, the use of vasopressin or the use of norepinephrine, uh, whereas a primary endpoint is uh, it was a composite endpoint of mortality and severe complication. And uh, they, uh, you can see that after cardiac surgery, by using vasopressin, they were able to show that there is a decrease uh, 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 of the primary endpoint. And this decrease was mainly due to the fact that when they used uh, vasopressin, they decrease the number of acute renal failure. It's a huge decrease, so it's, uh, in my point of view, it's a very strong result. And uh, uh, to highlight this, when you look at, at the Akin score, you can see that the decrease of acute kidney injury is not with the Akin 1, but it's with the Akin 2, with the Akin 3. It's with the more severe level of acute kidney injury. So it's a very strong result. And uh, uh, looking at the ART, there is also a very uh, high decrease in the number of uh, patients uh, uh, with uh, ART. So uh, a clear beneficial effect of vasopressin after cardiac surgery uh, in this trial. And other uh, interesting result in this trial is the fact that is there is a decrease in atrial fibrillation and uh, this uh, uh, with uh, no uh, more uh, complication with vasopressin. So clearly uh, a very uh, great impact of vasopressin on the prevention of acute kidney injury. About uh, angiotensin II, there is uh, only a very uh, few study. Uh, there is some study in preclinical study, but I just want to show you this uh, clinical study. It's uh, uh, the uh, famous study, uh, and uh, is they just had to look at the impact of angio II on the outcome of patient we require renal replacement therapy. So it's a small number of patients, and uh, they uh, show that uh, Angio 2 was capable uh, to, uh, uh, inc to improve the renal uh, the recovery ap after uh, ART. So uh, we need more study about uh, angiotensin 2. Uh, but uh, to conclude, uh, I think that early administration of uh, vasopressor must be used to maintain arterial pressure and renal perfusion in addition to optimization of stroke volume. Vasopressin may be preferable to norepinephrine as the first-line vasopressor agent in the management of uh, vasoplegic shock after cardiac surgery. In septic and hemorrhagic shock, the potential benefit of vasopressin on renal function should continue to be tested and concerning angio 2, we need more study uh, to have a clear idea of its effect on kidney function. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jacques. Questions? I'm, oh, Francois? Oh, we have Michael. Thank you. So, two quick questions. Um, do you think, given, so I'm a big fan of the renal perfusion studies, and given the disconnect between the glomerular filtration surrogate, so creatinine, urine output, and perfusion, do you think that creatinine levels and urinary output are valuable at all as resuscitation goals? So I, I, and so that's the first question. The other question is, you started your presentation with a perioperative study and you know, concluded that norepinephrine seemed beneficial. Do you think that that is relevant when treating uh, you know, the numerous patients in distributive shock, septic shock in the ICU, is like between periop and septic shock? Yes, to start with the second question. During a uh, perioperative period, it's not relevant uh, for septic shock. 
or hemorrhagic shock. It's a different situation. But what is interesting is that it's patient uh, most of the time uh, without acute kidney injury. Uh, it's a short period. It's a completely controlled period. And uh, it's uh, if uh, you increase uh, the arterial pressure. It's, it's funny to see that more and more we uh, apply this strategy. So more and more we use uh, catecholamine and uh, norepinephrine during surgery. And what we observe, and we have a study also in my uh, department, we observe a decrease in acute kidney injury. So it's a fact. So the second question is, uh, uh, so it's about the function. Uh, are the creatinine, the clearance creatinine, or the urine output the good factor to appreciate uh, the kidney function. We can discuss if when the kidney stop to function, is it adaptative or maladaptative. But right now, what we use in clinical uh, is uh, these parameters. So I just want to show the result in the preclinical study where they show that using vasopressor, they have an improvement. They have no decrease uh, alteration uh, of uh, decrease of the clearance creatinine. And so at the end, after several days, I don't know if it's good, but for what we look at right now, it's good. Okay, thank you very much. So our next speaker is Dr. Marcus Scrivers. I hope I pronounce your name correctly. And he's going to talk about what's best after cardiac arrest. Many thanks for that. Thanks for the uh, invitation and the opportunity to, to be here and discuss uh, vasopressors and blood pressure in your cardiac arrest patient. And it's, uh, it's been fascinating to listen to these talks and it opened my eyes a lot with, with regards to my own research and uh, on the use of vasopressors in cardiac arrest. So some conflicts of interest, nothing really relevant to this talk. Of course, if we think about a cardiac arrest patient, it's a bit different from a septic patient. Why do a cardiac arrest patient die? Well, it's all because of brain injury. Uh, some may die to multi-organ failure and circulatory shock, but it's definitely the brain injury that's the main killer. So if we think about blood pressure management, well, of course, if you have a right-shifted autoregulation curve, if you have cerebral edema, then perhaps a slightly higher pressure could improve blood flow in the brain and alleviate brain injury. Of course, we are sedating the patients, especially uh, when we were doing TTM at 33 degrees. Lots of propofol, lots of opiates, paralysis. That will decrease your blood pressure and will mean that you will have to uh, give more vasopressors to, to achieve a, a, a adequate blood pressure. And then, of course, TTM in itself may influence the way vasopressors are working. And the low temperature may also cause a bit of vasoconstriction, so in a way increasing the blood pressure. And of course, the heart. Francois nicely discussed the possible harmful effect by flogging a heart that not, that's not functioning well. Well, of course, a cardiac arrest patient who's perhaps, perhaps had, in many cases, a myocardial infarction would definitely be considered to be at stress so is it a good idea to, to flog this heart with noradrenaline, increasing the afterload? But then on the other hand, coronary perfusion, increasing the diastolic pressure may be good for, for this heart after cardiac arrest. And then of course the, the kidney that was also, also mentioned. But then again, how often do we need dialysis after cardiac arrest? Well, it happens, but it's d definitely not uh, a common occurrence. So what is the minimally accepted blood pressure after cardiac arrest? So it's mainly observational data. So here's a study from our, uh, our country, from, from Finland. Uh, in the Finn Rysuski observational study, we collected plenty of data during one year of all the cardiac arrest patients treated in different units. Uh, we had prospective data collection of their factors at resuscitation. And because we were able to access the hospital electronic patient data collection systems, we had a very granulated database with lots of map values, more than 1 million map values in these, 400, in these 400 patients over the first 48 hours. 
And we also had data on the use of vasopressors and inotropes. And the outcome was a neurological outcome at one year from the event determined by a neurologist. So what did we do? Well, this was shown uh, by Professor Tubul already the same strategy as Mario Tuvarpula did in her study 15 years ago. So we plotted the mapped values over the first 48 hours and then looked at different threshold values and calculated the areas below that threshold value. Uh, so this is, for example, the area below 60 for this given patient. Then we did the same for 65, 70, 75, and then compared these areas in the good and the poor outcome patients. So this is then what it looked like. So you had the good outcome patients here, the poor outcome patients there, and the areas oh, below these different uh, thresholds. So if we look at the values, you can see that, yes, less than 50, statistically significant different, as 55, 60, 65, 70. But then with 75, uh, this becomes not statistically significant anymore. So very indirect, but perhaps provides a bit of a signal what this sweet spot could be in terms of mean arterial pressure in, in a cardiac arrest patient. Other studies have been conducted in a slightly different way, but come to the same type of conclusion. So this is data from the TTM study, Danish and Swedish investigators, where they used a Cox regression model to estimate uh, increased mortality. So the higher the value here, the higher the risk of the patient dying. And here's the, uh, one, the mean blood pressure over the first 24 hours. And as you can see that when you go from lower blood pressure here at something around 65, this value crosses one. So suggesting no increase in mortality anymore if you have a value higher than that. So also providing a bit of indirect evidence that perhaps 65, 70 is the minimal accepted target. I'm sure you've all seen the autoregulation curves in terms of the brain. And this time we'll look only at the green ones. So cerebral perfusion pressure, MAP minus ICP. The question is, of course, is ICP elevated in all cardiac arrest patients? Probably not. But nonetheless, if you have your blood pressure or, or CPP here, you have a bit of leeway downward, so you won't decrease cerebral blood flow so much with a decrease uh, in blood pressure. The question is, of course, is this autoregulation curve perhaps rightward shifted in, in some cardiac arrest patients? And the question is, of course, could we somehow predict who these patients are? Could we identify which patients could, who could benefit from a higher pressure? And can we do that? Uh, so the, probably the only real possible way in a larger scale is to use near-infrared spectroscopy, where you can get a value suggesting uh, the cerebral, uh, cerebral oxygenation value. And by then looking at associations between changes in MAP and changes in cerebral oxygenation, you can get, perform a bit of math mathematical uh, calculations. You can get uh, some information about the autoregulation curve non-invasively. Well, this technique has many problems, uh, but that's the best I think we have at the moment to use in a non-invasive way. So if you do this, if you use the blood pressure data obtained over a period of time in ICU patients after cardiac arrest, and you estimate autoregulation, what do you come up with? So Ku and Amalut and colleagues, they did this uh, with 50 patients treated in their intensive care unit, and they found that 65% had preserved autoregulation, whereas 35 had a rightward shift in their autoregulation. And then they compared traditional, you know, clinical factors between these two groups, you know, age, the factors of resuscitation, the hemodynamical status when the patient arrived in the ICU, blood gases, to see whether you could somehow clinically predict, well, this patient has a disturbed autoregulation. The only thing interesting that, that came out was chronic hypertension. So if you had chronic hypertension, you were more likely to have a right shift in your autoregulation curve. Perhaps then meaning that perhaps these patients could 
benefit from a higher pressure, which is very interesting because I think it's completely the opposite as, as the 65 trial showed. Nonetheless, uh, no data that this actually could improve outcome, but, but this signal is there. So with regards to guidelines on what the minimally accepted map is, the current guidelines published in 2001 suggests targeting a map of more than 65 millimeters of mercury. Then how do you do this? Which vasopressor? Well, I put to you that the current evidence is for noradrenaline or norepinephrine. Uh, and what about it effects, its hemodynamical effects in the cardiac arrest patient? Well, we, we don't have uh, exact evidence on that, but we have got two pilot trials that have aimed to increase the blood pressure to a higher level of 85 to 100. There's this Belgian Neuroprotect trial and then a study from our unit, which, which I led, the Comacare study, where we basically randomized patients uh, over the first 36 hours to target either 65 to 70 or quite a high pressure of 85 to 100. So all in all, we, we pooled these databases together and looked in detail on the hemodynamical effects of noradrenaline. So all in all, 240 patients, out of which 120 had myocardial infarction. So either an ST elevation myocardial infarction or verified on coronary angiography. And if we then look at the, the use of noradrenaline in this, in this uh, pooled analysis, so if you target a higher pressure, you need more noradrenaline uh, than a lower pressure. Nothing really special about that. But what did that then do to the things that we think are important? And I, I echo the idea that diastolic pressure, probably important if you want to increase the perfusion of the heart, uh, because the coronary perfusion happens during diastole. Well, what did this do to the diastolic pressure uh, b when we gave more noradrenaline and targeted a higher pressure? Well, no surprise, higher diastolic pressure by targeting a higher MAP. But then the other factor, of course, that's also important is the length of the diastole. Uh, longer diastole, more time for the heart to be perfused. So, of course, you don't want to create any tachycardia. Uh, and in this study, very little difference in the heart rate in these 120 patients with myocardial infarction if you flogged them with quite high doses of noradrenaline. So we didn't see that much relevant tachycardia and also no change in rapid atrial fibrillation or other arrhythmias such as recurrent cardiac arrest by this higher dose of noradrenaline. So then, what did then do in terms of uh, organ injury? Well, these were pilot trials, so we looked at biomarkers. So we looked at biomarkers for cardiac injury, high sensitivity troponin over time, and then also uh, a biomarker for neurological injury. So the idea with using that, if you have a cardiac arrest, you have ischemia, and then these neurons don't fare well, they start to disintegrate and, and various substances are released into the bloodstream. Uh, and you can measure them with blood samples at 20, 24, 48, and 72 hours. And this is, of course, commonly used to predict outcome in cardiac arrest. So we looked at neurofilament light, which is a new marker uh, uh, describing the magnitude of the axonal injury uh, of a neuron. And, and it's been shown in a couple of studies to be very, a very accurate marker of outcome in cardiac arrest patients. So if we then looked at the levels of these in the higher and the lower MAP groups, we found that neurofilament light in the low normal group increased much higher than in the high normal group. So providing a perhaps a signal of a protective effect with this higher MAP target. Well, then how about the heart? Are we stressing the heart too much? So the only uh, endpoint that we had consistently was high sensitivity troponin. And interestingly, there as well. So a lower MAP resulted in higher troponin compared to the higher MAP target. So providing some evidence that perhaps this isn't at least that harmful for the patient. So take home message, what I said before, it's still pilot data. We're, we have been funded to do a larger trial on this and, and hopefully we can have that ready in a couple of years. Uh, but 
Until then, the take-home message is start a vasopressor to avoid blood pressures below 65 to 70. Consider a higher target if the patient has chronic hypertension. No randomized data, but uh, some signal is there for that. Use noradrenaline. It seems to have favorable effects in the cardiac arrest patient. Increases diastolic pressure, doesn't cause tachycardia, and doesn't appear to, to flog the, the heart that's struggling uh, uh, to, to maintain function after cardiac arrest. And some signals also of a decrease in injury, but that needs to, of course, be confirmed. And with that, I, I conclude and happy to take questions. Thank you, Marcus, for a very elegant presentation, also for your composure during the bells <laughs> sounding around here. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Um, I'm going to start then. Uh, comparing what we heard from previous speakers where we were talking about how low can we go, it seems from what you're saying that the question is almost the other, is how high can we go without uh, uh, causing problem on the autoregulation on the right side. So, I mean, your take on message is very clear about not going lower than 65, but you suggest that maybe a bit higher may be beneficial. How do you practically do that in your unit, also considering that in the first 24 hours, neurological assessment is clinically is very difficult? So, uh, in, in the pilot trials, very easy, we just said, we want to the nurse at the bedside, we want 80, 85, and it happened. It worked well, we got good separation without too much problem. Uh, of course, the signals about neurological injury, they're, they're later when, when you measure it, so you, you can't really say. Of course, the only issue here is that these were all treated with therapeutic hypothermia, so they were quite heavily sedated. So, so it's a question, if we stop using TTM, will they, these patients be as hypotensive as with hypothermia? On the other hand, you all, all the books say that you know, after cardiac arrest, you have a syndrome similar to septic shock, you're vasodilated, you have low blood pressure. So intuitively, perhaps it's still the case uh, if you don't use TTM. Uh, but in this subset of patients, it wasn't too much of a problem to achieve a higher pressure, with, I think, quite moderate doses of noradrenaline. Okay, and one very last uh, question, a curiosity actually. The Jean-Louis Teboul before was showing us that uh, norepinephrine will increase cardiac output in uh, this patient, especially if there is clearly a distributive shock about recruiting stress volume and so on. This type of shock at the beginning is different, but then it can evolve into a more distributive shock as well. Mm. Um, did you look at that? Did you see if the effect of higher doses of norepinephrine resulted in also in higher cardiac output and and perfusion markers? So, so this was uh, uh, conducted in five different hospitals and we decided, I mean, it would have been very elegant to have echoes or cardiac output measurement, but we wanted to keep it fairly simple because we also had targets for oxygen and carbon dioxide. So we didn't really protocolize at all what to do about cardiac output and we didn't really measure it. We have the lactate, so we could potentially look at, for example, lactate clearance. We haven't in any of the analysis yet, but that's definitely something one could, could do. But of course, that was one of the criticisms we got by the cardiologist. Are you sure that this heart is faring well if you start using noradrenaline? Well, we only have the outcomes, incidence of recurrent cardiac arrest, significant arrhythmias, and the troponins. And they seem to suggest that there's no much of a problem. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you. We'll now move on and I've introduced Daniel DeBacker, uh, who is local to Brussels, who's going to talk about uh, what is best for cardiogenic shock. And Daniel, I think if we've timed it just right, if you hear the bells and you're still speaking, time to stop. <laughs> Thank you. So, good morning. Um, So the, uh, the question now I will address is indeed the um, vasopressor therapy in cardiac shock. And indeed, I was a little bit afraid by uh, some talks this morning that perhaps I have to uh, shut down my presentation and jump away and go right away to 
do something else. But uh, fortunately, Marcus came uh, and Jacques Durant also. So we have indeed some reasons, perhaps, to use vasopressors even, even in cardiac shock when the heart may be so stressed by these um, vasopressors. Because indeed, we have to balance between two aspects. The first one is to optimize the perfusion to the organs. And of course, we have to pay attention to mean arterial pressure, but of diastolic arterial pressure also for the left ventricle, and that was just touched by uh, the previous talk. But we have also to minimize the detrimental impact that it may have, perhaps, on cardiac output. Just ask a question of two minutes ago market our function and market our metabolism. And so we will try to cover these different aspects. We review this um, with um, some colleagues uh, relatively recently. And indeed, one of the uh, very important aspects that even in cardiogenic shock, we may have some positive impacts sometimes with the increase in preload, sometimes negative also, admittedly. But we have indeed to struggle with the impact on left and right ventricle afterload that can indeed have some detrimental effect also on the other hand. So what will be at the end the uh, net result? We need indeed to discuss. Well, in line with uh, Francois Lamontagne talk, we have indeed a lot of data from cardiologists showing that what we do is bad. We are killing patients by using vasopressors. Just do better. Don't use vasopressors and your patient will be fine. Perhaps. Perhaps because we do not have indeed comparison of hypotensive patients without vasopressors. So indeed what is done here is comparing patients who are treated with vasopressors for, I hope, good reason, and patients who do not need therapy with vasopressors. And guess what? When you are not sick, you are better. I think that if we do something with the hospital, coming to the hospital is probably very bad because mortality in the hospital is higher than when you are home. Surprise, isn't it? So indeed, when we look at these data, when we look at more recent data, we have also the same aspect. We remember something very important. When you look at the, the, what the heart is able to do, well, when you use more vasopressors, the heart is able to do less. Oh yes, you are more sick. So that's just highlighting the severity of these patients. And you can try to do a lot of multivariable analysis to try to purify the signal. You cannot do anything. You treat patients because they are sick, not because they are well. So we need then to look at the data of patients requiring or treated with vasopressors to see which one will be the best. And then what is the best map target for organic shock patients? And perhaps in line with the data that Marcus just showed recently, we have some data in cardiac shock. Yes, we have some data in cardiac shock, looking here at different levels. And interestingly, in these patients, there were some signals from improvement, of course, in blood pressure, that hopefully, but also in cardiac index in these patients uh, by increasing the blood pressure and going back to the, uh, the, the, the basal level just after. Improving cardiac performance also here um, in, in these, um, and probably also improving some uh, indices of tissue perfusion, as we can see here, with the venous arterial PC2 gradient here. So, and the lactate also, of course. So there could be some beneficial effects here. Um, in some heart supported by mechanical system, uh, ECMO and others, we can say also that perhaps the heart is totally free of uh, the uh, detrimental effects there, but nevertheless, the ECMO not. So what, what do we have also a better pressure there? It seems indeed there also that um, uh, the uh, survival rate increased by increasing the, or having a higher pressure here. But again, this can be also just the association will be very cautious about this kind of data, of course. Do we have data in carry shock like we have this one? We don't have. So unfortunately, we, we cannot really transpose this kind of data, even though we, of course, discuss, is it reasonable to try to increase blood pressure to all patients? I will say, no, I don't treat my patient exactly the same. I need to have a problem to try to increase blood pressure. 
and not just randomize because I've decided that I have to randomize the patient to higher blood pressure. So at the end, we still need to be careful because indeed there was a higher rate of arrhythmias, uh, especially in the higher groups there. So there can be a signal indeed for having uh, some problems with vasopressors. Then when selecting the vasopressors, we have to think at what are the effects. And especially when we discuss adrenergic vasopressors, we act, of course, on the V1 receptor to increase blood pressure. But we have, of course, with the different agents, effects on other receptors. And remember that, in particular, the beta-1 and beta-2 are effective in the um, myocardium. And we have, uh, with norepinephrine, a limited beta-1 um, and even a limited beta-2 that exists uh, with this drug. And so that this can have some uh, effects there. Of course, epinephrine has a marked beta-1 and beta-2, and dopamine also has some beta-1 and beta-2 there. So this can have some effect um, on, on the different cells in the heart, but also, of course, in the peripheral tissues. So when we compare these different um, agents, well, we, have in, we, we can look at this kind of data. So um, here, so it was an illustration of norepinephrine in patients with a, a calorie shock. Um, it is an experimental model, but the most interesting is there is the fact that they were able to conduct pressure loops analysis, and these were, these were beneficially impacted by the use of, um, of uh, the norepinephrine in these animals, as well as the uh, DPD max. Um, so the contractile function was improved, despite the fact that there was an increase in the afterload there. So this is a very important aspect, and the ventricular arterial coupling that was reflected by these indices here was also improved by the uh, norepinephrine there. So the physiologic conditions with epinephrine, uh, with norepinephrine, sorry, was better than uh, with, without it in, in leaving the animal hypotensive in these conditions. So do we have data from uh, larger trials, randomized trials. Of course, when we look at dopamine and norepinephrine, we have to be careful. We have this kind of data, mixing patients in calorie shock and non-calorie shock, but we have exactly the same data in subgroup of patients with calorie shock, and we have an increase in heart rate in these conditions with dopamine, and more arrhythmias that are observed in these conditions. And remember that even though globally there was only a signal for a difference in outcome, in patients with scattering shocks, there was a true difference here um, with an increase in mortality in patients with scattering shock. And remember, the size of this group was not negligible in these conditions. And uh, meta-analysis um, of different trials um, indeed shows that uh, we have uh, this signal of an increased mortality uh, with dopamine and increased um, our arrhythmic events with dopamine compared to norepinephrine in these conditions. So what about other adrenergic agents, and in particular epinephrine, which is indeed used by some, um, some centers? Uh, well, if we look at the impact on the hemodynamics, uh, it's quite interesting that for reaching the same mean arterial pressure, there is no major difference in cardiacode. Yes, it is a significant one, but only from um, uh, 0.1 liter, which is quite negligible probably. If we look at the impact on heart rate, this was much more severe, um, with much more tachycardia, of course, with uh, uh, epinephrine. Lactate increased more. Uh, we may discuss what is the reason, but also we had an increase in PC2 gap there, which is more troublesome. And the diuresis was lower with epinephrine compared to norepinephrine and the butamine. So probably the combination of norepinephrine and a limited dose of the butamine to reach more or less the same cardiac output is better than the epinephrine based on these limited number of patients data. In a randomized fashion, in a multicentric um, trial, the same group of investigators observed that um, there was some detrimental effects with epinephrine, with more refractory shock in the epinephrine group than in the norepinephrine group. And also looking at other factors, um, there were, of course, um, there were more use of uh, ECLS in these patients, um, and of the trend for more use, and there was also 
some increase in mortality um, at 28 days um, for the patient receiving epinephrine compared to a patient receiving norepinephrine. So for that reason, um, it seems that epinephrine is not the best agent uh, compared to norepinephrine. And observational data also seems to highlight that uh, adrenaline or epinephrine compared to other vasopressors is associated with a lower survival probability. So uh, we, have, we have a lot of observational data trying to each time highlight the same aspects that compared to norepinephrine use, the um, use of epinephrine is associated with an increase in mortality here. And this data also shows that the highest mortality was observed here with epinephrine, especially at high dose compared to norepinephrine uh, in the same data. So if we look also at the uh, cardiac function, it seems also that even in assisted hearts, um, the, um, the, um, the, with Impella here, the use of norepinephrine seems to be better at least uh, to compare to, do, to, to dopamine and compared to phenylephrine. Perhaps here, epinephrine has a lower in detrimental impa impact because indeed these hearts were assisted in this condition already by Impella in these uh, patients. So what about uh, other data in, um, in, um, in VI ECMO? Well, we have here, uh, this data here, uh, showing that indeed patients receiving um, here uh, no epinephrine at a better survival compared to patients receiving epinephrine. And so these were patients treated with other vasopressors than epinephrine, of course, in these conditions. So all together, these data, um, even though each one individually is perhaps not sufficiently convincing, seems to point out that uh, among adrenergic vasopressors, norepinephrine is associated with best cardiac and um, patient outcome. So what about the other vasopressors? Well, of course, we have to discuss mostly vasopressin for which we have some data. But remember that when we discuss a bad effect of these agents for the vasopressor effect, we rely exactly on the same intracellular mechanism. So we have exactly the same mechanism beyond the fact that we have a different receptor on the surface of the cell. So what makes the difference between the agent will be receptor sensitivity, the disposition in the vascular system of the different receptors, which is quite different, of course, and the stimulation of other receptors, beta receptor in particular, but also V2 receptor, which is not that useful for the vasoconstriction, of course, and maybe some other receptors uh, in some conditions. And so if we look at the impact on vasopressin in refractory um, catering shock, we do not have a lot of data, but these patients here, as we can see, it was quite interesting to realize that vasopressin indeed was able to increase immune arterial pressure, great, um, to increase non-significant cardiac index, but so no major effect there, to decrease the requirements of other um, vasopressors and antropications, and no major impact on preload, if, if anything, a slight decrease here. But the most important aspect that compared to norepinephrine, you can see is that the cardiac power in this uh, patient treated with vasopressin uh, was um, stable here while it increased with norepinephrine, seeming again to suggest that the impact on the cardiac function is better with norepinephrine compared to vasopressin in these three patients. This kind of data we do not have, um, and so there could be some signal in some uh, some groups not supported with uh, other trials, not showing exactly the same. But nevertheless, what we can say is that we still have, when we look at all the data, some signals supporting the fact that we have less arrhythmias with uh, the use of vasopressin compared to norepinephrine. And this is something we need to pay attention to because if we want to individualize therapy, perhaps patient with Rapid atrial fibrillation are not the best candidate for norepinephrine and can perhaps be better to be treated with vasopressin. And especially because there was no major difference in outcome, well, using the best agent with less uh, side effects for a given patient is probably the best way to go. And the same may perhaps be when we consider other aspects. In here, skin vasoconstriction, less 
requirements of renal, re, renal replacement therapy with vasopressin, but also uh, more digital ischemia with vasopressin. So looking at the patient, if he's severely vasoconstricted, well, maybe not vasopressin. If the patient is more or less a little bit dilated, but uh, not, not passing urine, well, maybe vasopressin is good in these conditions. We do not have a lot of data looking at the impact on vasopressin. Here, we have this kind of data showing, oh, a major increase in, oh, yes, okay, but look at the number of patients receiving vasopressin, so minimal, so we cannot really say something there. And when we look at more um, large database, well, the use of vasopressin seems not to be associated with an excess in mortality, in opposition, of course, to epinephrine that we already discussed a couple of minutes ago. And so if we look at the impact of vasopressin in, um, in assisted models, then it seems to be quite interesting because indeed here you can see that uh, we have similar impact, of course, on ECMO blood flow, uh, but with vasopressin you give less uh, volume because of the perhaps impact on permeability. Uh, there is less increase in the wet to dry weight, um, uh, weight of the lungs, and also the uh, lactate decrease was more present with vasopressin compared to norepinephrine. So in some conditions here, there could be some beneficial effects there for vasopressin. But we have to be careful. The impact on outcome remains uncertain, and so we should be very cautious and just use it in some selected patients. And finally, if we look at what um, is used in, um, in, in reality in, in most of our patients, we can see that indeed there was a huge increase in the use of norepinephrine um, after the change of the guidelines, a decrease, of course, of the use of dopamine, even though surprisingly it does not stop at all. Uh, and you can see that indeed uh, vasopressin is uh, stable around 20, 25 percent uh, in these cases here. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, questions from the audience? Nothing? So just in your practice, are you using vasopressin in these patients? I just wonder, as you know, um, what sort of proportion you feel you, uh, you would use vasopressin? It's as a rescue. Um, so it's um, everything depends. Or, or second line agent, I would say. Um, second line agent meaning that if a patient is really tachycardic to begin with, um, I rapidly switch or try to uh, administer some dose of uh, vasopressin to try to decrease the use of norepinephrine in these conditions. So every, I, I pay a lot of attention to the uh, heart rate, and especially when we discuss uh, the diastolic time and other factors like this, I think it, it makes sense to try to limit the tachycardia uh, that uh, we observe in some of these patients. I think that makes sense. All right, we will go ahead of the bells and uh, move on to the next speaker. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to introduce the next uh, speaker, Dr. Jonathan uh, Cho from Washington. That's who I have in my list. <laughs> do we have a change in program or no? Okay. And do you may be in quarantine. I know the feeling. This is the list I was giving yesterday evening. So yeah. is he not maybe connecting from uh, abroad? No? Okay. Then I suggest if the next speaker is uh, here, we're going to invite uh, Dr. Lawrence Busset to speak about angiotensin 2. Okay. Uh, I missed the bells. Uh, so thank you uh, to the meeting organizers uh, for having me here. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, Larry Bussey. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, Emory University. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about what I perceive is the, is the correct way to use angiotensin II. Uh, I've seen it used uh, in cardiac arrest. I've seen it used in cardiogenic shock. Uh, and uh, neither of those situations ended up uh, turning out well. So I do think there's a correct way to use this. So we're all familiar with the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and the important role that angiotensin has within that uh, system. Uh, but the question we've struggled with now since the, uh, the approval of the drug in 2017 in the US and then thereafter in Europe is uh, how do we use it? What is the role for ANG2? Uh, is it to uh, 
support um, and uh, uh, reduce uh, catecholamine usage, as was seen in both the Athos and Athos three trials, uh, or is there? Uh, uh, are we trying to affect uh, mortality, something that neither one of those trials was able to show? Or are we just buying time, uh, waiting for the body to uh, cure itself from its septic uh, insult? And so the question is, now that we've got a number of different agents, the catecholamines, the vasopressin and its analogs, angiotensin II, methylene blue, B12, is, you know, do these different agents impact patients unequally? I think the answer with regard to ANG2 at least is probably yes. Uh, we've seen different outcomes in folks with uh, sepsis-associated uh, kidney injury. We've seen better outcomes in patients who only needed a small dose of ANG2 as part of the ATHOS-3 study. We see good outcomes in folks that uh, have an ACE inhibitor overdose. And so when we ask ourselves what do these uh, patient populations and probably indeed many other patient populations have in common, I think the answer lies with the with the RAS system. And I show this pictogram. This is something we published in the context of an ACE inhibitor overdose. Uh, but I think the pathophysiology is shared uh, uh, with regard to ACE inhibition, ACE dysfunction that we see in sepsis, and maybe a physiological ACE uh, deficiency in that uh, when you have dysfunctional or absent angiotensin converting enzyme, ANG1 fails to be converted to ANG2 and instead gets rerouted through an alternate pathway, a non-ACE pathway, uh, into ANG17. ANG17 itself is vasodilatory, so you have this imbalance between ANG2, a vasoconstrictive molecule, and ANG17, which is vasodilatory. Uh, and, uh, and I think this is in part why I think we see the phenotype uh, in sepsis that we see, which is hypotension. Uh, we know ACE activity is reduced uh, in sepsis, and this has been uh, uh, known for years, as shown by this uh, now over 20-year-old study by Ophanos, uh, who uh, uh, described uh, reduce not only levels of, of ACE, but also function of ACE uh, in acute lung injury and ARDS compared to normal lungs. Uh, and this makes sense. ACE is endothelial bound. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, and a large uh, portion of it is, uh, is, uh, resides within the lungs. Excuse me. Uh, ACE uh, level is also correlated with mortality, as seen in this uh, study by uh, 58 patients, in which the authors looked at a number of different substrates, uh, ANG2, lactic acid, ACE levels, and found that in regression, all of these were associated with mortality, as were the uh, commonly used and well-validated scoring systems, uh, Apache 2 and SOFA. Uh, low ACE levels actually performed very well and had a sensitivity and specificity that was very high, 88 and 73% for predicting mortality, uh, and, and interestingly, uh, outperformed both Apache and SOFA in this regard. So we took a look at ACE function in our patient population, and we did this by measuring uh, ANG1 and ANG2 levels uh, as part of the uh, ATHOS-3 patient population. In normal, healthy patients, ANG2 levels are generally higher than ANG1, and this is owing to a functioning ACE, and so the 1 to 2 ratio is less than 1. Uh, however, in septic patients, the opposite is true. ANG2 levels are lower uh, than ANG1 levels, uh, again, because of uh, dysfunctional or absent ACE, and so the 1 to 2 ratio is typically larger than one. And we saw this in our patient population where we calculated the one to two ratio and we found that it was in our, in our patient population 1.63. And interestingly, when we dichotomized our patients uh, along this median, so half above and half below, we found that the uh, folks with the one to two ratios that were uh, higher than the median, meaning more one and less two, uh, they had a mortality increase with a hazard ratio of almost two. So given our knowledge of the RAS and that ACE defects uh, are, are present in multiple disease states, including sepsis, and that there's a, at least in, in, in these circumstances, a relative reduction in angiotensin II, will giving ANG2 to these patients with these ACE defects improve uh, outcomes? And we found that that was the case with our patient population. Again, when we dichotomized our patients across that uh, uh, one to two ratio, so half above and half below, when we gave ANG2 uh, to folks that had a, a one to two ratio below the median, so a, a relatively 
higher amount of ANG2, there was no mortality benefit. But when we gave ANG2 to those folks who had a higher ratio, again, more one and less two, we did find that there was a mortality benefit uh, with a hazard uh, ratio of 0.64. So I wanted to turn back to some of the populations that I, uh, uh, that I uh, uh, introduced at the beginning, including the AKI population. This was a study that was already shown today uh, multiple times. And this is uh, our uh, post hoc analysis uh, of the Athos 3 patient population uh, of folks who had kidney injury and needed renal replacement therapy. And we found that in these folks who, uh, who uh, at the time of analysis had AKI and needed RRT, there was a survival benefit uh, uh, in, in those folks who got ANG2, 53% versus only 30% in the placebo uh, group. Uh, moreover, those folks that got ANG2 were able to discontinue uh, dialysis within seven days at a rate of, of almost 40% compared to 15% uh, in placebo patients. And so, why do we think that this patient population responds to ANG2? Well, again, I think it has to do with reduced uh, levels of ACE and a reduced relative amount uh, of ANG2. Uh, and this was uh, actually uh, supported by evidence uh, of this uh, of study by uh, Ducheron uh, back in uh, 2008, uh, in which the authors looked at 180 patients and they identified different genotypes corresponding to ACE, ACE expression. And they found that the, uh, the II, or the insertion-insertion genotype, which was the uh, expression that, that, that was associated with the lowest uh, level of ACE expression, that those folks uh, had uh, a higher uh, uh, risk of uh, AKI at, at, with an odds ratio of 6.5. Uh, and interestingly, those patients had a higher mortality odds ratio of 3.0 compared to others. We know the uh, importance that ANG2 plays within the glomerular with regard to kidney function uh, and, the, uh, and the effect that it has on the efferent arteriole. And I think there's probably an interaction, a uh, complex interaction between ACE, ANG2, and kidney function. And all this has mortality implications. And I think these, are the, this, these insights, I think, are why we saw what we saw with regard to this patient population. Uh, I turn back to uh, uh, the folks with ACE inhibitor overdose, and again, this is the pictogram uh, uh, describing uh, uh, the, uh, the RAS, and you can see the, uh, the effect that ACE inhibitors have on the RAS with regard to ACE and the rerouting of ANG1 instead of to ANG2 to ANG17. And these are the cases that we described within this case series. The first it was a 24-year-old female with a lisinopril overdose. Uh, and her map, you can see, was refractory to both norepinephrine uh, and vasopressin, uh, but responded uh, 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 very nicely to ANG2. And in fact, within 14 hours, all vasopressors were off. And the other case was a 65-year-old male, uh, also with an antihypertensive overdose, including lisinopril. Uh, again, the map was refractory to high doses of catecholamines, norepinephrine and epinephrine, uh, and it did uh, respond to uh, to ANG2, uh, and then uh, within an hour and a half, norepinephrine, you can see in the pictogram on, on the bottom there, uh, was, uh, was turned off uh, within uh, 90 minutes. And so I think these cases illustrate uh, that, uh, that ANG2 is, is probably the, 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 the antidote for ACE inhibitor overdose, and I think this is not a mystery to those folks in this room. So this is a strange study we did. Uh, this was a pre-specified analysis of the Athos-3 population, uh, looking at uh, uh, folks who only needed a low dose of ANG2 as part of this uh, study. Uh, and what we did is we compared patients who required only five nanograms per kg per minute or less of ANG2 to those who required uh, more. And you can see uh, from the Kaplan-Meier curve there, uh, there was a decent mortality benefit in those folks who only needed a small dose of ANG2. Now, interestingly, these patients also had a lower baseline uh, pre-study level of endogenous uh, ANG2. And so we asked ourselves, why would this make sense? And I, and I think uh, the answer is that uh, in this patient population, we, we elucidated uh, those folks that had 
likely an absence of physiological levels of angiotensin II, and that the dose we gave them, the five nanograms or less, was, was likely a repletion. And this is uh, uh, supported by this uh, study now uh, almost uh, 20, year, uh, uh, 20 years old by uh, uh, Fleischer, who, uh, who gave uh, angiotensin II, this is you know, the, the prior molecule, not the uh, Geopreza molecule, uh, to folks uh, at a rate of 1.5 nanograms per kg per minute, and found that that infusion level uh, equated to a 50 picogram per, per milliliter uh, serum level, and that is the upper limit of normal in the physiological range. This is further uh, supported tangentially by the fact that uh, folks who uh, receive ANG2 earlier in their disease state seem to do better. And uh, this is a, a, a picture from a manuscript that we have submitted now, so the, uh, the data is embargoed. But uh, we uh, evaluated 90 post-cardiac surgery vasoplegia patients uh, we treated them with our, uh, with our protocol uh, in which we uh, give ANG2 at lower levels of catecholamines at 0.2 uh, or, le or uh, less. And we found that uh, and those folks that, uh, that got ANG2 at this level of catecholamine dose actually had improved outcomes, including 30-day uh, mortality. This, is, this, by the way, is not unique to ANG2. I think the same... Uh, 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 assertion was made with the vasopressin data. Uh, so these are the populations that I think have a, uh, a, uh, a relative deficiency of, of ANG2 based on uh, ACE implications. This is a little bit more controversial, the use of ANG2 uh, in the COVID population. Uh, we know that the SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, which is the virus responsible for COVID-19, uses ACE2 to enter the cell, and that the, the level of ACE2 probably correlates with infectivity. So it stands to reason uh, that uh, reducing uh, ACE2, ACE2 levels may actually attenuate uh, disease. And ANG2 uh, is theorized to be able to do this in a number of different ways. Uh, during uh, uh, degradation and hydrolysis uh, and, and metabolism to ANG17, ANG2 binds to ACE2 and so therefore uh, competitively inhibits uh, and, and effectively blocks uh, the virus, the spike protein from, from, uh, you know, from uh, uh, attaching to, uh, to ACE2. Uh, moreover, when, when ANG2 binds to the AT1 receptor, which is its dominant receptor, uh, it, uh, it signals uh, destruction of ACE2 through ubiquination and internalization into, into the cell. Uh, and lastly, uh, when, AT, uh, when uh, ANG2 binds to AT1, uh, there is a downgrade of ACE2 expression. This, by the way, is a theory. There are competing theories, of course, uh, that have been uh, published as well. Um, uh, it's important to know that, that I, I think no, no one theory seems to uh, outperform another with regard to outcomes. And I think this is supported by the fact that uh, there's been a number of case uh, studies uh, in the literature describing ANG2 use uh, in COVID-19 patients. Uh, and I've used this anecdotally, and I can say that uh, while um, uh, I, I, it's not a cure for COVID uh, in any respect, it certainly also doesn't uh, 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 cause any worse outcomes. And this was shown uh, in this, uh, which is the largest uh, case series of, of ANG2 in COVID-19 of 16 patients, uh, in which the uh, authors reported an increased P to F ratio uh, and, uh, and that 14 of 16 of, of them were alive in seven days. And I, you know, I think this, this data is lukewarm at best, but it really does show that, that ANG2 is probably safe in these patients and should be used uh, when, uh, when indicated. So I'll summarize. Uh, ANG2 seems to be a benefit, uh, of most benefit in those with an ACE deficiency, such as ACE inhibitor overdose, early shock, uh, AKI, there's unclear benefit uh, in, in folks with COVID-19. Uh, and, uh, and so the real question is, how do we identify those patients uh, uh, with ACE deficiency that really would respond uh, to ANG2? Uh, and I would encourage you, if you uh, have the, uh, the time to see my talk, which is the last talk today, 
uh, at 5.30 about uh, using a renin as a biomarker uh, to identify these patients. And with that, I'll end. Thank you, Lawrence. We have uh, time for questions. Any questions uh, from the audience? Um, otherwise, I'm going to start. Uh, a very practical question, first of all. Um, do you actually use it now in your practice, sometimes, uh, often, or it's mainly research? ANG2? Yeah. We use it all the time. Uh, we have a very established protocol in my university uh, in which uh, we deploy uh, vasopressors of different classes uh, with different mechanisms in a multimodal approach uh, and try to avoid situations where our norepinephrine is up to 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 kgs, uh, 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 you know, uh, mics per kg per minute. Uh, we find that those patients don't do well, uh, and so we, we really try to deploy a balanced approach. We use this drug, you know, it's not, certainly not as common as catecholamines, uh, which are first line in our institution, but we use it all the time. So it, it, it's very interesting because when this drug came out, we were all very excited because, you know, it's one new vasopressor after many years that we can use. But with Tony, we, we did some studies on vasopressing, and the, one of the discussions that we often have is, uh, are we sparing norepinephrine but just adding another vasopressor? And so, it, you know, in simple terms, are we just squeezing the circulation in another way? Or do you actually uh, think that there is a role to, you know, to play early or late in some refractory shock? So how, how do you select these patients? Uh, so that's a good question. Are we, just, are we just swapping one agent out for another and really just, just defending the map? Um, you know, that's, that's, that's the major question. Is, uh, is there a benefit to using uh, less of, a, of catecholamines uh, and perhaps defending the map with ANG2 and vasopressin. You know, uh, I, I think there is a benefit in that strategy. I think we've seen that strategy play out in a number of different disease states. We certainly don't give someone uh, a gram of metoprolol to, to treat their high blood pressure. Uh, we use uh, different agents with, with uh, different mechanisms to, so as to uh, alleviate side effects. Uh, there are certainly side effects with high-dose catecholamines. There are side effects with high-dose vasopressin and side effects with high-dose angiotensin too. Uh, and so I think using uh, different agents at lower doses will, uh, will, uh, would be a benefit. But, but from an analysis point of view, I don't think we have definitive studies that can tell us that yet. Tony? Can I ask, um, and you, you hinted at it, and I don't want you to give your um, biomarker talk later, but I mean, the, I also thought it was very interesting, the, the uh, ratio data that you showed. Yes. Just to understand, I mean, what are the practicalities? Could that become a clinical test to identify? I mean, I know sometimes these are very difficult molecules to, to measure, collect, yeah. et cetera. Just briefly, do you think it's possible to develop a diagnostic that we could use? Absolutely. The, ratio, the ratios, no. Uh, well, at least in the current state, ANG1 and ANG2 levels are difficult to measure. We don't do that routinely. Right. Okay. Uh, certainly ACE levels we don't measure. Most of that is endothelial bound and we can't uh, achieve a good measurement. But renin correlates very nicely with both ACE levels and ANG1, ANG2, and I, I do talk about that later. And renin is widely available. Uh, it's easy to obtain. You can check it now. Uh, and uh, and it, uh, it really I think does illustrate very nicely uh, the, the role that ANG2 could potentially play in these patients. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, let me, where, where are we? So, uh, the next speaker needs no introduction but, um, because you've seen him before. I hope <laughs> we got the right order still. So, Jacques, uh, if you'd like to come back and now give your second talk about the effects of vasopressors on the micro microcirculation. Thanks a lot. Welcome back. Yes. <laughs> so, um, what are the uh, effects of uh, vasopressor on uh, microcirculation? If I can get. Oh. Yes. So, uh, it's, uh, it is obvious that uh, it depends on the type of vasopressor and uh, on uh, the dose of vasopressor. 
And uh, this is very important because uh, there, is, uh, there is very few study about this. Uh, the study just looking at uh, increasing dose of vasopressor and uh, because at what point it could be deleterious at the uh, microcirculatory level. And uh, the other very important uh, point that we have to consider when you, you, you uh, have a look at the literature is uh, does the macrocirculation is uh, correctly optimized or not. It's very important because it's not the same to look at the effect of uh, vasopressor without and with optimization of macrocirculation. Another point is the nature of the microcirculation. There is not only one microcirculation, there is several microcirculation. It's not the same to look at sublingual microcirculation and kidney microcirculation. Because kidney microcirculation, the regulation of kidney uh, microcirculation <coughs> is largely more complex than the regulation of sublingual microcirculation. And another uh, point is, in uh, what uh, uh, disease you look at microcirculation. Is it during hemorrhagic shock? So it's uh, a, a short period. Uh, most of the time, uh, uh, as a physician, we are from the start of the story. Or is it during septic shock? Uh, where uh, we, are, we arrive late in the story, where uh, alteration of microcirculation may be more severe. And even if you give you improve the flow, you give vasopressor. Sometimes in some patients, alteration of microcirculation are so high that there is no effect. So it's, everything is important to, uh, to consider. And uh, so, the, sorry, I'm sorry. And uh, one limitation is in human is the lack of technique to assess and monitor at the bedside microcirculation in uh, our practice. Uh, so uh, a first study is a study in hemorrhagic shock. So I want to share with you uh, some study in hemorrhagic shock, in septic shock. I, uh, I use slides that I used this morning, but I, I, I will make some uh, remark on this. Uh, the first is in hemorrhagic shock, uh, uh, where uh, we, um, it's uh, in animal model, and uh, uh, we try to test the effect of norepinephrine uh, during an uncontrolled hemorrhagic shock. Uh, just because uh, by given uh, norepinephrine, you can uh, get a target of mean arterial pressure, and you can decrease the quantity of liquid that you give, and in hemorrhagic shock, it's important because uh, uh, you uh, decrease the dilution and you decrease the bleeding. So uh, uh, we test two levels of arterial pressure, uh, uh, mean arterial pressure of uh, uh, 50 and uh, another of 60. And uh, this uh, with fluid without norepinephrine and uh, with norepinephrine. And uh, when we use norepinephrine, we uh, decrease the quantity of liquid that we have to, to give uh, to uh, add uh, this uh, objective of uh, mean arterial pressure. So we decrease the bleeding during this uncontrolled hemorrhagic shock. So it's uh, a, a huge argument to use norepinephrine or vasopressor in hemorrhagic shock. And what about microcirculation? We analyze microcirculation at the mesenteric level, so a very sensitive uh, microcirculation. And what we observe we observe that despite the fact we use norepinephrine, we have no change in the density of microcirculation. So we don't close the microcirculation. And one reason is that maybe because we induce a flow by norepinephrine, but we have to keep in mind that the regulation of microcirculation, it's not only catecholamine, it's all also nitric oxide, it's also reactive oxygen species. So locally, it's CO2. So there is other mediator which delete the microcirculation despite the fact that you use no, uh, a vasopressor. 
So I show you uh, this uh, uh, slide this morning. So uh, the idea was uh, to test during resuscitation uh, arginine vasopressin or norepinephrine in a rat model uh, after pressure control MRH. And uh, uh, I show you that uh, it has uh, uh, no deleterious impact on the recovery, even if there is a slight uh, uh, beneficial effect with arginine vasopressin at the uh, medullar uh, level. What is uh, important in my point of view is that uh, once again, uh, the main interest to use uh, during hemorrhagic shock vasopressor is to decrease the bleeding, not to induce more dilution and by given fluid and more bleeding. So I think in, uh, uh, with this result in my mind, it's possible to use norepinephrine, but also maybe arginine vasopressin could be very interesting in hemorrhagic shock. And uh, there is still no deleterious effect uh, of, uh, at the level of the kidney. Once again, this slide uh, that I show you this morning, just uh, to uh, uh, discuss a little bit more. So we saw that uh, in, uh, by inducing uh, an endotoxinic shock, uh, they, uh, in uh, this uh, experimental model, they induce uh, uh, a decrease in uh, renal uh, function. And what was uh, interesting here, they compare norepinephrine and arginine vasopressin. So I show you that uh, the uh, renal blood flow was preserved, uh, despite the fact that uh, there is an alteration in the kidney function. And I show you that uh, the arginine vasopressin uh, and norepinephrine has no or uh, no deleterious effect at the level of the cortical microcirculation, but there is in this model a decrease in the medulla microcirculation, and arginine vasopressin seems to be uh, a better vasopressor concerning the restoration of uh, uh, microcirculation at the medullary level and uh, in terms of PO2. And uh, this was, uh, uh, in parallel, there is an improvement of the function. I think what is interesting in this, uh, the, this experimental model is that clearly we have a problem of microcirculation at the medullary level. And even if arginine vasopressin seems to do better than norepinephrine, we have still a deep decrease in the microcirculation at medullary. And even if there is an improvement of the function, maybe we can do better at the uh, level of the medullary. And do better, it's, I told you that it's very important to be sure that there is an optimization of macrocirculation. And in this kind of model, I'm not sure that we have a very uh, nice improvement of macrocirculation. So maybe, we can do better in our patients by just by performing a good uh, optimization of macrocirculation. But what is interesting is that in the same group, they test the angiotensin II in the same model. And what they observe, they observe that at the level of cortex, there is angiotensin uh, doesn't, uh, uh, is not, was not deleterious, but at the medullary level, there is, in comparison to saline, there is no effect. Despite this, there is an improvement of uh, the creatinine clearance, an improvement of our uh, urinary, our, uh, urine outflow, and uh, the fractional sodium expression. So clearly, the story is more complex than just flow. We have a problem at the medullary level, and maybe we have, to, we have to work on this to find maybe a better a way to improve the medullary microcirculation. But when you give arginine vasopressin, when you give angiotensin, contrary to norepinephrine, you do other things because 
we observe in this uh, uh, experimental study, they observe an improvement of the function. So there is the flow and there is the function. And you, when you give arginine vasopressin or you give angiotensin 2, you do other thing maybe on function than just playing with flow. So I think it's interesting to think about this. So um, this study uh, where uh, I think it's also interesting to, uh, to test if uh, we uh, don't do a mistake with norepinephrine. And uh, this study was performed uh, in uh, Hamburg and uh, it's during surgery, it's uh, during prostate removal, and uh, the authors look at sublingual microcirculation in this patient. The strategy uh, was uh, until uh, the removal of prostate to practically don't give fluid and just play with norepinephrine to maintain mean arterial pressure. So it's, I think it's very interesting because it's, you play only with norepinephrine and give no, despite the fact there is a bleeding, give no fluid. So it's the right condition to be deleterious at microcirculation. And what they observe, they observe that despite this, there is no significant change in sublingual microcirculation. So no deleterious effect of this strategy. So I think it's interesting because it's a way to validate this uh, strategy and uh, to, uh, to keep this strategy uh, for their surgery. Another uh, example is in septic shock. We uh, always want to uh, play with the level of arterial pressure in septic shock. Uh, without uh, knowing if it's good for uh, microcirculation. So in this study, they uh, analyze sublingual microcirculation and uh, they increase the mean arterial pressure in, uh, normal in uh, hypertensive patient and uh, in normotensive patient just to see what was the effect at the level of uh, microcirculation. And uh, in both cases, they observe an improvement of the sublingual microcirculation. So no, once again, no deleterious effect of uh, uh, norepinephrine when they increase the dose of norepinephrine in this patient. And it's an effect of pressure, you increase the pressure, but just to consider always that when you give norepinephrine, you induce an improvement of venous return and you improve the cardiac output. So it's not only an, a pressure effect, it's also a, a flow effect, but no deleterious effect. And uh, in uh, the study from Morelli, they uh, compare uh, what uh, they, it's a septic patient uh, uh, and uh, norepinephrine, and they introduce uh, terlipressin or arginine vasopressin or placebo uh, to uh, look at the effect uh, uh, of uh, in microcirculation, sublingual microcirculation. And uh, so when they introduce uh, terlipressin or vasopressin, they decrease the uh, rate of norepinephrine, and you can see that uh, they observe once again no deleterious effect when they induce these uh, two uh, vasopressors. So um, another interesting uh, study, I think it's a very nice study because it's a study trying to, to have a look on uh, cerebral microcirculation and uh, in my knowledge is uh, the first good study uh, on this uh, and uh, on the effect of vasopressor. And it's a patient uh, who uh, will have a surgery uh, for a tumor or for a brain tumor. And uh, they uh, compare in the study the effect of uh, ephedrine and phenylephrine and uh, using uh, RMI. Uh, and what they observe, they observe that uh, uh, phenylephrine, uh, ephedrine was, um, uh, despite the fact that it was an increase of the same uh, amount of mean arterial pressure, they observe that uh, uh, ephedrine was capable to improve the cerebral blood flow. 
and to improve brain tissue oxygenation and decrease oxygen extraction fraction. So I think it's very important uh, when you are in the operating room with this kind of patient and uh, if you do uh, phenylephrine only uh, and uh, you are not uh, very uh, uh, take care of the volemia, I think there is a, clearly a risk of decrease in the cerebral blood flow. So I think it's, it gives us uh, very important information. In conclusion, I think that it's, uh, uh, we have plenty of work in the future about this because uh, there is uh, several microcirculation in, uh, in, uh, in our patient and uh, we need more tools. Uh, to have a clear view of what are the effects of vasopressor uh, on this microcirculation. I show you many examples of uh, uh, nice effects of uh, vasopressor on microcirculation. I think we have to be cautious about high concentration of uh, vasopressor because there is only a few uh, data. And uh, I think that uh, we have to work hard to have more data on microcirculation and the effect of vasopressor because it's so important for our patients. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jacques. Now, I think we're going to have plenty of time for questions. Um, so please, <laughs> if anybody has any uh, questions, now is the time, I think, maybe on this talk or even your previous one, I'm sure, if you have... A... <laughs> But um, you mentioned that you said uh, we need more tools. I mean, that's what I would want to ask you is if you could design something for, for use in the clinic, what, what would be most useful for us to, um, to be able to know better about the microcirculation in a, you know, a clinical ICU, not a research tool? Is that a possibility? Um, yes, I think that uh, uh, for me, uh, the um, echography is uh, capable in the future to give us very, very nice tools uh, to explore microcirculation, for example, at the hepatic level, at the kidney level, uh, because there is, uh, uh, right now, uh, there is uh, 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 a very uh, a good data on uh, new tools and uh, I think that it's a question of, uh, of some years to have a, a tool that uh, give you the opportunity to work at the bedside and uh, to have a, a, a clear view of microcirculation. So uh, I'm very uh, optimistic about this. Okay. A, a, a good development maybe uh, to look out for. Uh, are you talking about uh, contrast ultrasound, Jacques, or Not some only. other techniques? Not only, because uh, contrast uh, ultrasound, it's a, it's a, it's a great technique. Uh, we use it in uh, our daily practice uh, for the brain uh, and uh, for the, the kidney. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, I think uh, it's, uh, there is, uh, without... Uh, 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 injecting agent. There is uh, now uh, a very more precise technique and uh, so I think uh, we, we will have uh, new tools in the future. And following that, if I remember correctly, a few years ago you published a study uh, seeing how uh, nurses could use uh, uh, cameras to look at the microcirculation at the bedside. Yes. And is it something that you routinely do now in your uh, uh, unit? That, I mean, for, for people that are not familiar with the technique, it's possible to see the microcirculation under the tongue, but it's a very laborious technique traditionally, and it takes a lot of processing of the data. So it's not something that can be used for point of care testing, but you were showing some initial data, just, just eyeballing the image could give you yes, some information exactly. there. So uh, it's... Um, it is still a, a complex uh, uh, method to use. And uh, even if we prove that nurses was capable to use it and uh, capable to have uh, uh, an idea uh, of uh, uh, microcirculation, I think that uh, it's, it's very difficult 
uh, to, uh, to use it uh, uh, daily uh, because uh, we have to prove first that it's really efficient, it changed, it has an impact on outcome to, uh, to look at uh, microcirculation. And if we are capable to prove this, it's very difficult, but uh, it's, uh, uh, I think that the staff will uh, uh, adopt this because it takes time. And uh, this time uh, we know uh, it's uh, with the COVID, we <laughs> everything was <laughs> Will change, but uh, and time was was very important. But uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, if uh, with this kind of method you can have a really a real time software to analyze, it will uh, it will be a, a, a very uh, good. Uh, uh, it could be a very good tools, but uh, there is still work to prove this and. Uh, to, uh, to have a good uh, uh, adoption uh, of the device by uh, the staff. Thank you very much, Jacques. Um, we are going to make a change in the program because of the uh, no-show of before. I don't see Professor Xavier Monet yet in the audience, so Dr. Houston. But I know that Professor, ah, Dr. Houston is here, perfect. So I, if it's okay with you, I will ask you to anticipate your lecture and then I'm sure that Xavier will come always on time for his. Okay, so I'm Alexander Jostlen. I'm an anesthesiologist, originally from uh, Belgium, from Erasmus Hospital, but I've been at Bicet and now Paul Booth Hospital since the past uh, three years. I'm going to discuss uh, automated system to guide vasopressor administration during surgery, but also in the ICU. I'm going to wait for the slide because there is a change in the, in the speaker. We are testing the t technicians now because yeah. we made these last minute changes. Very okay, good. so automated titration of vasopressor could make our life easier. Yes, I believe in the future, of course, because Automated system for the moment are still considered as research tools. So before I start, I have uh, to disclose some conflict of interest. I'm a speaker for these companies and I've received a mention research grant. I also have an ownership interest in a Perceptive Medical, which is a company that we developed in the United States to, uh, of course, to develop our automated system for vasopressor administration. So today we have a lot, a lot of studies showing that there is a strong relationship between hypertension and patient outcome. And this is true both in the operating room, but also in the ICU. The topic is so hot that many times now we have the cover of some high impact factor journal uh, assessing the importance to avoid hypertension, both during, but also in the post-operative period. What we know is that when we maintain blood pressure within a narrow range, we decrease the incidence of organ dysfunction. This makes me believe that there is a strong causal relationship between a tight blood pressure control and patient outcome. And in another studies, we also showed that in chronic hypertensive patients, when you maintain blood pressure between 80 to 95, you can have a lower incidence of acute kidney injury. This is the only two studies showing a link between blood pressure control and patient outcome. So what is the, our current practice? So we check our critical ill and high-risk surgical patient in both uh, Erasm and UC Irvine of patients with continuous norepinephrine administration. This is just a picture of what we do. You can see that in more than 50% of the time, we have a map between 60 and 80. More than 10% of the time, we have a map below 60. And in 40% of the time, we have a map above 80. This means to me that blood pressure management today is suboptimal, and there is room for improvement of blood pressure management. Of course, the solution is to automate the aspect of 
vasopressor administration using computers. And closed loop is a system when you have a computer or regulator which monitor one or multiple variables and then will adjust the infusion rate of vasopressor fluid or any kind of drug to maintain uh, the variable within a nano range. Physiology is based on automated system, feedback control, cruise control, self-driving car that we may have in the future. And in medicine, we already have a lot of automated system. And even an FDF-approved system for glucose control. What we know is that automated system compared to human management better maintains a given target within a narrow range and decrease over and undershooting of the given target. So it's not a novel idea. Back in the 80s, we can see the first iteration of automated system for blood glucose control or even for vasoactive drugs. And since the past 10 years, we can see an exponential increasing number of publications using automated system in perioperative medicine. For vasoactive drug administration, the first system was done in 1979 with an automated system to decrease blood pressure using sodium nitroprusside. And today we have at least seven main research groups uh, who are uh, developing an automated system for vasopressor administration, but they are still in their experimental development. So we also develop our own automated system for, fluid administ uh, for vasopressor administration, and we test this in silico and also in vivo in our lab when we induce some hypertension uh, stress episode with high dose of sodium nitroprusside for 30 minutes, low dose, high dose, low dose. And we did it in seven pigs, and we, did, and we did nothing. You can see here that blood pressure will go down, then a little increase, go down, and in little increase. And then seven pigs with the automated system, which maintains mean arterial pressure between 75 and 85 for more than 95% of the case time. Do we have some clinical studies? Until today, only two teams around the world develop an automated system for vasopressor administration, one in Singapore, another one in Hong Kong, but they did it in low-risk patients for C-section under spinal anesthesia, and they used ephedrine alone or in combination with phenylephrine. So we decided to move on in high-risk surgical patients and to use continuous norepinephrine infusion. So we did the first pilot study including 20 patients, and we showed that patients had 2.6% of the case time with hypertension. We did it in major abdominal surgery, here even major vascular surgery, but also you can see that patients spend 0% of the case time with a MAP below 65. Here you have the MAP, and here the continuous infusion of norepinephrine. But we also did this in a, a case series of three uh, cardiac surgery, on pump, off pump, and mid cap. As you can see, some pictures. So the staff anesthesiologist can spend more time to teach some TE while the system can maintain mean arterial pressure within a narrow range. Here, with robotic cardiac surgery, this was back in 2018 when I was at Erasmus Hospital. I did at this time a lot of cardiac surgery. And once again, you can see that. The the anesthesiologist can try his new tool, uh, a 3D TE, and once again, even with an on pump with the system here, you can see it. We also tested this system with a non invasive continuous blood pressure monitoring device, and of course, we did it in three cases of renal transplant surgery because we know that we like to avoid invasive arterial line in this patient population. Then we move on to ICU patient also with a trauma brain injury patient with the automated system here, here the EE monitoring. And here you have a patient, a septic patient awake that need a surgery. And so during a two hours period, I asked the nurse to maintain mean arterial pressure above 65. And then I put the automated system for two hours. And then once again, I asked the nurse to continue. And then I, con I wanted to continue uh, the study, but uh, the patient had to go for surgery. And you can see that when the nurse managed the blood pressure, patient spent 
46% of the case time between 65 and 75. We felt a lot of hypertension because the lower alarm is well uh, corrected, but main, mainly it's overshoot of norepinephrine. Then the system control it well with still some hypertension, but much less hypertension under norepinephrine administration. And we have the same behavior in a trauma head surgical patient. Then we did a small randomized controlled trials, and obviously we decreased the amount of hypertension from around, in median, 50% to less than 2%. Then we also did uh, the study in post-operative period after a cardiac surgery. We did it in a clinic because they had a high volume of cardiac surgery in Lyon. And the main objective was the percentage during the post-operative period with a mean arterial pressure below 65. And once again, we can see the system here, the computer, the infusion pump, the uh, hemodynamic monitoring for fluid titration in the patient here for the post-op recovery. And once again, the same type of figure, you have around 12% in median of hypertension in the manual group versus less than 2%. Then we have an ongoing studies in a BSET hospital where the goal is to control mean arterial pressure in brain injury patient. Here in the control group, we record instantaneously all the hemodynamic variable from the patient monitor and also all the advanced hemodynamic monitoring continuously, and the nurse had to titrate norepinephrine to maintain a mean arterial, mean arterial pressure within a narrow range in order to maintain a good cerebral perfusion index. All patients should have an intracranial pressure, of course. And in the automated group, you can see that we put the automated system together with the registration of all the patient monitoring, and here you have the nurse who manage the patient during the study. So this is the two different patients, but they had the same um, kind of uh, MAP target. So the goal was to maintain mean arterial pressure between 80, between 90 and 100. And once again, you can see that in blue, this is a patient manually managed by the nurse. Most of the time, it's, we are above the target, while within the system, we are in the target. So we did a poster for a grant application in the US. I'm not going to let you read everything, but just here the graph that you can see, it's the analysis of the first 20 patients of the group. You can see that once again, with the system, we are more within the target than when it's done manually. So of course, it's nice to administer vasopressor, but you don't have to forget to give fluid to the patient. So our long-term goal is to both create a system that can both co-administer automatically fluid and vasopressor. But we are still in the development of this system. So what we did is that we did a randomized controlled trial comparing a goal-directed fluid therapy and vasopressor administration. The goal was to maintain MAP and uh, a uh, stroke volume index within 10% of patient baseline values. And in the other group, we use the automated system for vasopressor administration in combination with assisted fluid management for bolus fluid recommendation. Here, the system in one patient, you can see the system, the computer infusion pump to maintain mean arterial pressure to the patient. And here, the advanced hemodynamic monitoring system with the assisted fluid management software which is going to recommend to the clinician when to give a bolus of fluid, then analyze the effect of the bolus on stroke volume and stroke volume variation, and then continuously will reassess the patient for further fluid requirement. In this graph, you can see in purple, the closed loop group, we have a higher stroke volume index during surgery, and the map is maintained within a narrow range while in green, you can see that we have a much higher variation in both stroke volume index and mean arterial pressure in the control group. So one team has already developed this kind of continuous fluid and automated vasopressor administration, but to my knowledge, they are still, once again, at the experimental development. But this is the long-term goal of many teams today. 
Why? It's because I believe that in the operating room we can automate many aspects of the anesthesia, the hypnosis, the nociception, fluid administration, anti-idol CO2 administration, and we did a brief report showing that this was feasible in patients undergoing major vascular surgery. We even show recently that using multiple automated systems in the OR in all patients undergoing major surgery can reduce the incidence of, of postoperative neurocognitive disorders. And for some author, automated system may be the future in the operating room. So if you want to further your knowledge in this topic, I recommend you read these four recent review articles on this topic. So once again, it's nice to have automated system, but sometimes you, have, you may have acute blood loss or even sudden event. And in this case, of course, you can let the system work, but you have to override the system. That's why you still need to have an anesthesiologist on board. Because otherwise, you may have this kind of complication with a self-driving car killing a, a cyclist. And here, you know this Boeing 7, 737 where the pilots complained about the autopilot because finally, they couldn't uh, take hand of the, on, the, on the aircraft. So we try now to uh, implement some safety issue on our automated system because, you know, if, for example, the sensor drop, you can have a sudden increase in blood pressure, but in fact, the patient doesn't need any uh, uh, um, uh, decrease of vasopressor, etc. So today we are trying to implement some small safety issue into our automated system using machine learning to try to help and to be more safer in the operating room and also in the ICU. That's why I don't believe that the goal of any automated system is just to replace the clinician at the bedside, but it's rather to assist us. When we develop our automated system for both fluid and vasopressor administration, we try to be drug agnostic. It means that we don't care, the system don't care about the fluid the system needs to administer, about the vasopressor the system needs to administer. I think this is a medical strategy and this should be in charge of the clinician. But once the target has been chosen, what the drugs had be, has been chosen, then the system is here to assist us. And that's the goal of automated system. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alexander. Any questions from the audience? Question there? There we go. Thank you. Uh, great presentation. Uh, you, the patients that you uh, are treating are, are in the operating room and therefore in all likelihood healthier than those folks that are uh, in a medical ICU. Uh, do you foresee that this system or this approach could be used with a sicker patient population that's not in the OR, that's, that's medically ill with, uh, uh, with uh, the septic shock, for example? Yeah, it's still possible, but uh, for the moment, especially for the vasopressor, it's still, uh, uh, we can say, uh, we still need to have uh, someone uh, um, supervising the system because, you know, it's a dangerous drug, vasopressor. And uh, we, we had some, uh, some troubles. For example, uh, what we had is that suddenly I forgot to plug the computer. That's very uh, pity, but then the system stops suddenly. So we don't if you don't have any uh, clinician on board, other, another stuff, uh, I left the room for just a few minutes to go to the toilets and then the syringe was empty and the nurse couldn't, uh, no, she didn't know what to do. So, you know, for the moment it's still a research tool, but we expect that with safety issues, we may see this in the future. But for the moment, we still use it just for research. Following on this question, um, what do you think is the going to be the biggest problem on the implementation of these techniques because the you know the the evidence around uh, high potential in uh, around surgery in the operating room is overwhelming you know you, you can yeah, I take think it uh, 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 you know whatever you want but if you go below 65 you have an increase of, of acute kidney injury myocardial injury and so on but if you go around the operating rooms we know that that awareness or that belief of clinicians is not there to try to treat it. 
So do you think the hurdle will be more in raising the awareness of the clinical problem? Or it will be that actually clinicians, they don't want an automated system in their operating room? Yeah, I think uh, first, a clinician uh, don't like to change their practice, so it will be difficult to implement. But uh, for people who knows how to use it, they are very happy. Uh, the nurse anesthetist in my, uh, in my hospital, uh, they were first a little uh, um, scared about using this system. But then uh, when I am with them and show them how stable the anesthesia duration and variable are, they are pretty uh, comfortable now to, to use this. So I think the, the main limitation will be uh, the acceptance by uh, the, the clinician. And then, of course, to not believe that the system is here just to do the job and then we can leave the room because once again, it's an autopilot. It just means that for bolus, 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 or increase or decrease all the time the amount of vasopressor, that's not the job I want to do as an anesthesiologist. I think this, this kind of task can be done by an automated system, but under or supervision, I think. Yeah. And I think in intensive care is going to open a completely new chapter because probably the targets that we set will be real targets even in, in research. So. Can I ask, um, do you have any feel from what you've seen um, what the difference is? Is it uh, that the automated system uh, reacts quicker to a change, you know, big changes, or is it that it's just constantly making little changes all yeah. the way along or something else? Yeah, so I didn't show you the, the result, but you can read it. Per hour, the system can do around five to 1,000 micro adjustment of the dose when a nurse for the post-op cardiac surgery enter the room maybe four to five times per uh, two hours to change the infusion rate or fluid bolus administration. So I think uh, the, I even think to answer your question that I can do a job as good as the computer is my only task would be to do manage the pump or the bolus of fluid. But of course, I cannot focus 100% of my attention dedicated to this task. But otherwise, I think I can do a, a job as good as the computer. But the thing is that uh, there is human factor. We cannot spend uh, our time uh, just adjusting the infusion rate of drugs for long hour because in surgery, we can spend uh, around uh, eight, 10, 12 hours managing this kind of uh, patient. So it's a help, I think. Okay. Okay. No. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much. So we will now go back, switch the order uh, back. We have Xavier Monet, uh, who is going to talk about norepinephrine and how it may complement fluid administration. So welcome. Thank you very much. And I first disclose for this presentation that um, if it's uh, available. Thank you very much. That it's, um, I collaborate with uh, Pulchian Medical Systems and uh, with uh, Baxter. In fact, let's take the very practical example of a patient with uh, septic shock on first day. For instance, with ARDS, with a community acquired pneumonia, and uh, PF ratio is low, and the patient has already received. Uh, one liter and a half of saline. Basically, what is the hemodynamic pattern of this septic patient? Sorry to remind you the very basics of pathophysiology. We know, of course, that in this patient there is arterial vasodilation, which is strong and which will promote norepinephrine administration. But there is also venous dilation both can contribute to relative hypovolemia because it will decrease the amount of fluid coming toward the heart, the heart and the cardiac cavities. There might be cardiac dysfunction and of course the microcirculatory and or mitochondrial dysfunction uh, contribute to tissue hypoxia. Okay, why do I remind this uh, uh, very basic elements because, of course, for treating these different uh, uh, abnormalities, we will use 
fluids first to compensate for the relative hypovolemia and sometimes absolute hypovolemia as well, we will give norepinephrine with basically the aim of increasing blood pressure and especially the mean arterial pressure and sometimes the butamine in the very few patients where norepinephrine does not increase cardiac output anymore in patients with low LV contractility. That's the basic treatment and it's likely the way many colleagues see the treatment of these patients. The question we have to address in the next minutes is to know what is or what might be the interaction between fluids and norepinephrine in septic shock patients. And basically, basically, the issue is about fluid. Because we all know that giving too much fluid is very bad. Fluids, definitely, fluids are drugs. Like as antibiotics, they have adverse effects and they are not constantly efficient, as many, many other drugs. Giving too much fluid is toxic. We know that it may first increase the amount of lung edema, especially in the areas. It may increase the abdominal pressure, induce hemodilution, promote right ventricular failure, etc., etc. Even more, it's been really demonstrated. I always show this first study clearly demonstrating the risk of excessive fluid administration in septic patients in the subcohort of the SOAP study, the cumulative fluid balance, the total amount of fluid administered minus diuresis, was an independent predictor of mortality, independently from the other markers of severity. But you all know that. So the issue for us today in 2021 is to know how to reduce the cumulative fluid balance in these patients. What's the pattern, the profile of fluid administration? We give a lot of fluid during the resuscitation phase, less fluid during the stabilization phase, and during the de-escalation phase, we may remove fluid. And the area under the rack curve is the cumulative fluid balance we want to reduce. How do we do that? First of all, we individualize fluid therapy, which means that we do not give fluid in patients that will not respond to fluid, that are not preload responsive. And it's a logical reason for assessing preload responsiveness. We may remove fluid in patients where it is possible. But also, and it's my point today, we may increase the fluid efficacy with an early administration of norepinephrine. How may norepinephrine reduce these fluid requirements? For understanding that, we must keep in mind that, of course, basically, norepinephrine is supposed to fix the arterial receptors, sympathetic receptors, the alpha receptors of the arteries. And the main reason why you start on norepinephrine is for increasing blood pressure. Bear in mind that there are also some alpha receptors on the veins and that norepinephrine also constricts the veins in our septic patients. This may increase cardiac preload. And today it's been clearly demonstrated that yes, norepinephrine increases cardiac preload. We showed that uh, uh, ten years ago with uh, Jean-Louis Teboul, we showed that CVP increases with fluid administration. Elvin diastolic area increases with norepinephrine administration as well. Then the question was, how does intrinsically norepinephrine increase cardiac preload? And for this, we must go back to the basic physiology and especially to the physiology of this part of the circuit, which is the um, venous return. You know that venous return is the flow through both vena cavae, which is the flow of blood coming back to the heart. On equi at equilibrium, it is equal to cardiac output. The heart can only eject what it received from the right side. And as it is a flow, venous return, 
is determined by a pressure gradient between the right atrial pressure, which is obvious, and forward, the mean systemic filling pressure, you know, the pressure at zero flow. We may say that this pressure stands at the end of the very small veins. It's likely wrong, but just to figure out how it works. And in fact, you see that the connection of the vena cava with the venous tank, with the venous reservoir, is not at the bottom. It schematizes the fact that there is a part of venous blood which is stressed by the veins walls, and it's called the stressed blood volume that creates the mean systemic filling pressure that promotes venous return, and there is an unstressed blood volume which is not constrained by the veins of the walls. It does not contribute to the venous flow. And of course, it might be a reserve in case of problems. It might be a reserve to be recruited in case of hemodynamic failure. And as in any flow, the resistance opposes venous return. Okay, and um, to understand the rest of the talk, we must go back to this um, model of the venous return developed by Arthur Guyton years ago. He developed decades ago, he developed this um, relationship between venous returns, the flow, and right arterial pressure. And the curve reads from the left to the right. If you increase right arterial pressure, let's imagine you push on the free wall of the right atrium, cardiac output decreases, okay? You, you. And so, by the way, it means that if the flow is zero, it means that the right atrial pressure equals the mean systemic filling pressure. It means, and it's my point, that on this, uh, on this figure, mean systemic filling pressure is the intercept of the curve and the x-axis. And the resistance of venous return is uh, represented by the opposite, uh, the inverse of the slope. And these are the two determinants of venous return. Mean systemic filling pressure minus RAP and resistance to venous, to venous return. All this to ask, what are the effects of norepinephrine on these determinants of venous return? Through venous constriction, you understand that norepinephrine may recruit the unstressed blood volume. By the way, it may also increase the resistance to venous return. It, it would have an opposite effect. That's why, uh, almost 10 years ago, we investigated the effects of changing the dose of norepinephrine on the mean systemic filling pressure, because today it's possible to estimate this physiological variable at the bedside. And for this, we used a, I won't enter into details, but a, a, a method that uses heart-lung interactions. Anyway, we changed the dose of norepinephrine. We measured the mean systemic filling pressure, and we wanted to know whether it was changed or not by norepinephrine, significantly or not. And actually, we showed that, yes, norepinephrine increases the mean systemic filling pressure. The slope also slightly reduces, which means that the resistance to venous return slightly increases. But the net effect is an increase in venous return and cardiac output in case of preload responsiveness. Unfortunately, these results were confirmed with the same method by the team of uh, Jos Janssen, Yasin Tamas, and Michael Pinsky. You see the same results, and it's always very fortunate. It means that if the patient is preload responsive, if the heart is working on the ascending part, the steep part of the frank stalling curve, this increase in venous return is accompanied by an increase in cardiac output. In other words, when you give norepinephrine to your patient, or when the patient produces norepinephrine, it contributes to increasing cardiac preload. 
It's a fluid-like effect, an additive effect to fluid administration. Nevertheless, it may be even more. It may be a synergic effect. I mean that let's imagine that the patient has already received norepinephrine. You will agree with me that the next fluid administration will dilute in a smaller venous circulation rather than a large dilated venous network. It's very likely that this patient will respond more to fluid administration. It will be more potent in the constricted venous circulation. This is what we investigated in this study. We recently published uh, in critical care with uh, Iman Ada and, of course, jean louis Tebul, and we again changed the dose of norepinephrine. We decreased the dose of norepinephrine, and we, uh, and we mimicked fluid administration through passive leg raising in order to be reversible. We wanted to know whether the change in mean systemic fitting pressure was larger for the same volume at the higher level of norepinephrine, and we compared these PLR-induced changes in norepinephrine. And actually, it was the case. At the highest dose of norepinephrine, passive leg raising, the fluid, uh, the, the, the uh, similarly fluid, the pseudo-fluid challenge was more potent on mean systemic filling pressure. And so it's in favor of this synergic effect of fluid administration. And yes, giving norepinephrine early in addition to fluids in our patients may increase the fluid efficacy. It may first accelerate the restoration of mean arterial pressure, which is a big advantage, and also complement fluid infusion. Any demonstration, we had this first retrospective study a few years ago, retrospective, so they compared patients with norepinephrine administered before two hours after the onset of septic and of sepsis and after two hours. Early administration was associated with less administration of fluid. And by the way, the mortality was the highest in the patients where norepinephrine was, was administered at the latest uh, times. There has been this RCT produced by the team of uh, Jan Bakker and Gustavo Spinatako. Randomization be between very early norepinephrine before one hour after the onset of septic shock and later. Again, very early administration of norepinephrine led to less fluid administration and to a lower mortality at, uh, at uh, 20 days. Of course, it's a one-center study. We need some more demonstration, likely. But uh, these, these studies, small size studies also, were summarized in this meta-analysis, just confirming that, yes, when you start norepinephrine early, you give less fluid, you restore MAP faster, and eventually you may improve prognosis. So yes, definitely, I think that norepinephrine may complement fluid administration. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Xavier, for a very uh, slick presentation. Um, Questions from anybody? Uh, I will ask one, it's actually uh, almost the same question as um, was asked earlier uh, of your uh, colleague, Jean-Louis. The idea of giving uh, low-dose norepinephrine peripherally outside of the ICU, um, if we really want to give it early, just, we've seen, there are studies now, but I just, some of this comes down to the practical aspects. If I were to say this in my hospital, I think alarm bells would ring and so on. Do you think it's, we can persuade hospitals, do you manage it as an enthusiast in your center to be able to get um, low dose vasopressors started outside of the ICU when you're trying to get a patient in? We would like them in, but the reality is we can't always get them into ICU. Thanks a lot for the question. Risk and benefit. The benefit might be in this patient's that stay long 
before the ICU admission, and we know that these patients exist. In these patients, yes, I think that we should teach our colleagues how to use norepinephrine. You know, the first reason why people do not give norepinephrine early is that they think it's not possible to give it on a peripheral line, while we know today, and there have been many studies about that, that it's safe for a, a short time on a peripheral line. We should, they should be taught how to, um, how to set the dose of norepinephrine and perhaps automated uh, um, devices for administering norepinephrine may help at this phase also. Definitely, I'm sure that it is much better than patients who arrive in the ICU after administration of four liters of fluid just because people didn't dare starting norepinephrine early. Yeah, the, I mean, hearing all the talks today, but also obviously seeing all this over the years, it just seems to me this is I can a big uh, challenge that we should take on because it's um, many clinicians would like to do it, but are put off by hospital system. John Lee, you have um, Can comments? we have a microphone, please? Of course, I totally agree with that. That's okay, okay. We, hear, okay. we could hear. Yep, we can hear. It's working. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. I totally agree with Xavier. In addition, uh, studies like the Chinese study uh, that uh, Xavier showed also showed that the earlier you give norepinephrine, the shorter the duration of norepinephrine administration, and the lower the total dose of norepinephrine during the stay of the patient. This is in the paper by uh, Bay and co-workers from China. So I think that we have a big advantage to start very early because finally at the end of the day we give less and we have a less adrenergic load uh, in, in the body of the, of the patient. So we are uh, very enthusiastic fans of uh, starting early, maybe in the world of the uh, emergency department and as I, I answered the same, uh, finally, I answered the same uh, answer uh, as uh, Xavier uh, to, to, to start with a peripheral access. There's no problem for this if it is for a short time. Yeah, so maybe uh, a future sort of education and strategy we could, uh, should work on in our hospitals because I think it is rare uh, to be able to do it even if you want to. Um, so any more questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank Xavier. you again. Thank you, Xavier. And uh, last but not least, we have Professor Massimo Girardis from uh, Modena, who is going to put uh, everything together that we say this morning. Good luck. <laughs> Hello, good morning. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Thanks, Maurizio, for this point. I think that after this uh, very long day, very long morning, sorry, uh, it's quite a difficult task to make a summary of all information that uh, we had in the last two hours, um, but I try to give you some, uh, I don't know, uh, tips from clinical experience, um, just some idea for improving how our, uh, how our daily life uh, with our patient. Um, I have no disclosure for this talk, uh, and I just want to start with uh, as a, a summary for all the day, as an ancient, ancient Italian rhyme uh, motto, uh, mantra, morphina and noradrenalina e arrivia mattina means with morphine and noradrenaline you can survive to the night shift. And this is a very old, uh, this is the first year resident program. I was uh, very early in the morning with my patient uh, and physician say, okay, start noradrenaline. It's better than fluid. It was 20 years ago, and now after 20 years of fluid and uh, vasopressor controversy, we are again on the same line. Probably, probably the vasopressor are better than we believed before, or that I believed before, and many, and many of anesthesiologists and intensivists believe. How many patients in our real life? Here you have uh, the database coming from um, high number of in, in Italian intense, intensive care units. Uh, more or less, we have 
uh, 50,000 patients per year. And you can see that in our daily life, we have to treat about 20% of patients admitted to the ICU with shock. And it's important that septic shock and hemorrhagic hypovolemic shock and the cardiogenic shock is more or less on the same level in terms of incidence. And during the stay at admission and during the stay, 35% of the patient receive uh, vasopressor. So it's a big issue for us and we have to be real prepared for that. And I think that it's the same in the, in, the, in the bottom part of the slide, you have data coming from uh, um, the, the SOAP and, and uh, ICON trial, it's quite the same, 25% of the patient admitted to the ICU uh, presented and uh, um, cardiovascular dysfunction. So it's important, 30% of our patients receive azopressin during ICU stay and 25 at the ICU admission. Um, and what about the normal behavior. It's an important publication two years ago, before COVID, and now it could be interesting to, to make again this survey. Um, and the, 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 the question was, what is your main trigger in factors for initiating a vasopressor in septic shock? It was, sorry, it was a survey on septic shock in uh, Europe as well in, as in other, in other continents. 65% uh, uh, of the respondents come from Europe, came from Europe and the other from outside Europe. And the answer was 80% uh, of the respondents say, I start after uh, I, if we have a low mineral pressure after uh, initial fluid resuscitation. Um, this is the trigger. Uh, when do you use vasopressor? And you can see that there is two, the, we have two different responses. 44% say I use vasopressor only after assessment of preload dependency. Great. This is a clear indication of our uh, normal activity in measuring something. And the other point is uh, I start only after complete fluid resuscitation, 27% of the, of the respondents. I think that, 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 that that's two vision of when to start vasopressor, which is the trigger, sorry, septic shock, of course, uh, when, to, when, when to start vasopressor in terms of trigger, and uh, I just think to vasopressor and when really to start vasopressor is quite a normal uh, behavior in many of our, of our uh, ICU or pre-ICU patients. Um, another interesting point is which is, which is the, the, the first vasoactive drug or the vasoactive drug used in, in, in septic shock. Uh, the answer was 97, as you say, uh, say norepinephrine. Yes, it is correct as a, uh, for, for, for the now the, the indication that we received this morning. But it's interesting looking to the trials. You have two different trials on hydrocortisone as a genitive therapy for supporting patients with uh, refractory septic shock. One came from French, the other from the Australian New Zealand uh, um, group. And you can see that there is some differences because uh, of course many of the patients receive noradrenaline, but if you look in French, it's quite more frequent they use norepinephrine, whereas in, uh, as a, probably as a second vasopressor, uh, whereas as a second vasopressor in septic shock uh, in Australia and New Zealand, the most preferred is, uh, is uh, vasopressin. So probably as, as the first vasopressor, we are on in line with norepinephrine, probably early before the stop of fluid resuscitation, as a second vasopressin, we can have some discussion uh, still uh, uh, open uh, and uh, probably we have uh, uh, to make more research and analysis of larger databases for understanding which is better between adrenaline or vasopressin. Um, another scenario is hemorrhagic shock. Of course, uh, uh, due to the pathophysiology of hemorrhagic shock, the idea to use vasopressin hemorrhagic shock is not common, but uh, many experts recommend that, as probably discussed before, uh, probably the early use of vasopressor uh, could be helpful in patients, particularly at the beginning of resuscitation. 
And in fact, in this again survey, um, the, um, the, the expert respond, responded that 70, I don't remember exactly, 75% of the expert respond, responded that they agree with the early use of vasopressor. Which are, the, which are the, 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 the common use vasopressor are dopamine, this is probably because uh, is uh, the most used vasopressor outside the ICUs and OR. And uh, the second one was uh, adrenaline and noradrenaline. Uh, it's a different pattern, septic shock and hemorrhagic shock, but at the end of the story, uh, I think that vasopressor in some way is uh, again, uh, a, 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 probably we have to use uh, uh, at the really beginning also in hemorrhagic shock. Um, what about the guidelines? Uh, I don't know because I missed the, the first presentation. I don't know if someone talked about guidelines uh, on all these concepts that uh, we received this morning. Um, I think that the guidelines is difficult to understand really on these points because uh, here you have cardiogenic shock as presented before by Dr. De Bakker, it's quite complicated to understand which is the right time for starting, which is the right and appropriate strategy for managing a patient with cardiogenic shock. In the upper part, you have the guidelines coming from the European Society of Cardiology, as vasopressor uh, say that vasopressor should be started only after that we try to manage the patient without vasopressor, with a nitrop. But also with the inotropes, it's quite interesting to see that the indication for a nitrops uh, drug, for a nitrotropic drug, is only when the patient is hypertensive or with clear signs of hyperperfusion. And in the, just a review and some uh, clinical indication published uh, two years ago, again before COVID-19, uh, the, 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 the authors, Blue Levy, I, indicated that probably vasopressor as well as inotropic drug in cardiogenic shock should be used late and for, for a very short period of time before, of course, reperfusion, mechanical support, or another. Um, this is based on, uh, on clear literature evidence, not at all. As Daniel said before, we have not, a, not clear indication coming from uh, use of inotropic drugs as well as vasopressor in patients with cardiogenic shock. What about sepsis, septic shock? Here we have more, more studies, and as I, I showed you before uh, and, uh, and with the, the survey, uh, uh, the survey in, in the same, in the same uh, uh, publication, we have a survey, we have a survey and also a, a sort of consensus of expert. And as in the survey, the experts say, okay, the norepinephrine should be started as soon as possible after an initial fluid resuscitation and for me also uh, definition and identification of patients with clear sepsis and without cardiac dysfunction because I think particularly if we go outside to the ICU and before to start norepinephrine, I fully agree with the use in peripheral vein, but before to start norepinephrine, it's quite important to have some in information coming from the heart. Of course, echocardiography is the first in my mind, but it's not the only one, because put noradrenaline in a patient uh, without having a check on metabolic parameters as a oxygen saturation, uh, the difference in PCO2 between arterial and venar and arterial blood could be harmful in patients, particularly outside to the ICU. Anyway, when I have identified a patient with septic shock without cardiac dysfunction or with a mild, moderate cardiac dysfunction, it's important to start norepinephrine. This is the same from the expert group from Europe as well as the expert group that we had two years ago in Italy together with Maurizio and other friends. And what about the first, uh, which is the first vasoactive drug? Again, noradrenaline, as the ancient motto that I show you in the first slide. But this is, again, based on uh, clear evidence. Um, when, when I, when I to, to seek for, for evidence, I, I don't like definitely Cochrane Library in, in general as a vision, but it's a very, uh, you say, practical method for understanding the evidence in, at that point of the, 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 the story of the research. And when you look to the 
uh, Cochrane Library in terms of phenotropic drive as repressor drugs, the conclusion are always the same. We have no indication that when and which are the right drugs is based on, uh, um, as you say, solid and sound research and studies. And it's interesting because it's the first time for me in, in Cochrane Library that I realized that the conclusion of the author say, probably we have to discuss more on a strategy than uh, when and which, uh, after or before fluids. And I think that the strategy for optimization and individualization so of, of therapy for the patient could be the right way. So the question is how to put in action this kind of uh, uh, personalized approach to uh, patient with shock. I think that it's quite complex and we try to, 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 to make a, just a summary of which could be a protocol in, in our, in our uh, consensus, uh, um, consensus uh, conference with uh, Maurizio and the others in Italy and we just try to put in this uh, algorithm all the um, today knowledge on monitoring uh, sorry, identify, which, is, which are the clinical and metabolic parameters to identify a patient with shock. The main goal, which are the site of intervention, cardiac output, anemia, hypoxemia, which are the methods for improving and the targets to reach. And if you just look to this uh, picture, you see that vasoactive agents or inotropic drugs should be at the end of a long pathway. Means I have to apply my knowledge by identifying the patient, then we have to define our strategy in terms of goal, where I have to, to, what is my first intervention to do, and then methods and targets. And I think this is probably the best method that we have today for improving how our uh, personalized approach to patients with, with shock, general shock, cardiogenic, septic, hemorrhagic shock. Um, there are other, other ideas. Here you have uh, another consensus coming from uh, um, the uh, American Earth Association on how to manage, how to personalize the approach to patients with cardiogenic shock. Uh, different shock on the first column classic wet, ergolemic, but it's quite interesting because the answer is always the same, not a printed frame for all the condition. Um, that could be right, but I think this is not personalization of the treatment. This is just to try to make more confusion. Um, I think that uh, I fully agree that not a printed frame is uh, probably one of the best, uh, one of the most important drug that we have when we have to manage a shock in general, but we have to know that we could have a lot of problems with norepinephrine. I mentioned one before, the patient with cardiac dysfunction and sepsis could be a very complicated patient to manage. The other are adrenergic stress, patient unresponsive to noradrenaline. So I think that it's time to have, as shown this morning from many presentations, it's time probably to make more research in, a pers in to, to seek for other ways for personalization of the treatment. And uh, here you have just some idea for managing patients with cardiac dysfunction and va vasoplegia in terms of permissive hypotension, alternative vasopressor, the use of adjunctive therapy, temperature control, particularly in sepsis, uh, use of uh, blood purification as well as different inotropes. I think that putting together the knowledge that we have and some research that we need for uh, uh, alternative strategies for managing patients with shock, septic, cardiogenic, and maybe also hemorrhagic shock, probably in the future we will have uh, uh, more, more uh, clear effects and probably increase the survival of the patient because, uh, this is my last picture, my take home picture is that patient acquired vasopressor are not similar, particularly during the time. Um, are different at the beginning, risk factor, but also during his uh, day, day pathophysiological course. And most importantly, I think that vasopressors are not similar. Thanks a lot.
Thank you, Massimo. So at the end, is norepinephrine and morphine for everyone. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, jokes aside, if you have to give a message to a trainee at 3 o'clock at night, a new patient with shock, I mean, apart from norepinephrine and morphine, if you have to say in a few minutes or in a minute, you know, how to approach hypotension, what would you say or what do you say? Okay, um, the, 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 the call during the night from my, my colleagues is I have a very young, young, young guy at, at the emergency department with a clear shock. Uh, they call me after two hours, I don't know why, but the patient remains in shock for two hours, what I have to do. Of course, the first, my indication is, uh, please, give me some idea which is the reason for the shock. And so, f before to start with any kind of resuscitation for shock, fluids and vasopressor, I think that is quite important, if it's possible, of course, to try to have more information uh, from the patient in terms of clinical, of course, story of the patient, clinical signs and uh, uh, variables. Uh, I think that in these days we can, I, I, can, I can have a, a clear idea without an echo. So echo, echo fast is, I think, the, the right way now for understanding the patient, a patient without story or a patient without clear chronic pathologies. Uh, uh, I think that is quite important. And this is the first part. The second part that I ask is to have a, a blood gas analysis, but in the arteria and in the venous blood. And if it's possible to have some coming from the central line. Um, after that, probably in the, in the meantime, uh, I suggest to start with the uh, fluids, or if the patient is not uh, uh, positive in terms of uh, uh, echo, uh, lung echo for B lines. And uh, fluid therapy should be, could be generous at the beginning. Uh, I suggest usually 10 milliliters per kilo in the first 30 one, minutes, one hour. Um, but then after the diagnosis of understanding the reason for, for shock, I just suggest to uh, start with a sort of vasopressor or inotropic drug with very early at the beginning. Jean-Louis. Uh, Massimo, thank you for your talk. I agree with many things. Uh, I would like to, to ask you, you showed uh, a protocol recommended by the Itali Italian society, I think, and you put uh, vasopressors at the end of, of the protocol. My point is, I agree with you that peripheral signs of shock are very important, PC2 gap also, SVU2, etc. But if you have hypotension at the beginning, Hypotension means MAP less than 65 if you want. 65 is already lower than the normal diastolic arterial pressure in normal people. So if you have a low MAP, you have a low DAP by definition. Is it not possible not to have a low DAP? And DAP, the main determinant, is vaso vasomotor tone. So my point is, as soon as you you measure a low MAP, by definition, there is a problem with the vascular tone. By definition, uh, hemorrhagic shock, uh, cardiogenic shock, septic shock. So my point is that we, want, we need to correct very rapidly the vascular tone, not with a very high dose of uh, norepinephrine, even a low dose, but it is important not to put this at the end of, of, of the protocol. This is my opinion, of course. I, I would like to have your yeah, opinion. Uh, yeah, definitely. I just, I, thanks a lot for, for the comment. I, I fully agree. Uh, in, the, in the protocol, I just show you that uh, in the hemodynamic evaluation, before to start with vasopressor, we need more information than only diastolic pressure, sorry. Uh, so we need to have, if we, the patient is really in a shock state, of course, we have to need to understand which are the main reason for this problem before to start a vasopressor. And if you are able to do this activity in half an hour with an echo and some blood gas analysis, I think that you are on the right corner of the story. But I fully agree with you, a patient with a story of uh, uh, cardiac disease, uh, and I think that a, a diastolic pressure very low should be immediately treated for avoiding uh, myocardial infection of coronary attack, something like that. I fully agree, definitely, yeah. Are there any more questions from the floor? 
time if people want. If not, I'll say thank you very much, Master, for that uh, summary at the end, and thank you to all the speakers for what I think was an interesting session of physiology, clinical trials, and an insight to the future. Thank you very much.